Don't be afraid of fats. Don't be afraid of the fats. The fats are your fuel and you have to treat your body like you're priming a lawnmower. So you have to prime the pump with a lot of fats first so the body gets adjusted to using those fats. That's the number one thing because people just, they get afraid of fats. We've all been conditioned to believe that fats are bad. You think you're gonna spend your golden years together and with Alzheimer's, it's about a seven year prognosis on average, you know, that someone's expected to live. We thought, well, we're not gonna get to retire together and share our golden years together. So pretty devastating news, really. Around 2006, I kind of caught on to, you know, this might have something to do with food. And I found this press release and basically it said it was a medical food that improved the memory and cognition in nearly half of the people with Alzheimer's that took it. And I thought, wow, you know, you don't ever hear that about Alzheimer's drugs. Any creature has an innate ability to have perfect health. All I am now is a detective that finds out what are those factors that's preventing my patient from healing himself, and then teach the patient to take those factors away from them, and I don't have to do a thing after that. It's absurd to blame genes and think that somehow we now have a weak gene that's causing breast cancer or a weak gene that's causing obesity or a weak gene that's causing Alzheimer's or whatever else. It can't be that somehow our genes change and all of a sudden we have high blood pressure and it can't be that we've lost the ability to self-regulate. That doesn't make any sense. What's happened is we're under stress and it shifts our autonomic nervous system, our, our fight or flight versus our rest and digest and we move towards fight or flight and that shifts our physiology. Well, welcome, welcome to another edition of The Real Skinny on Fat, The Truth About Weight Loss. I'm Montel Williams. And I'm Naomi Whittle. And we're on our fourth day of an amazing journey into the fascinating world of health and nutrition, and we're so lucky to have Naomi as our guide. Thank you. Thank you, Montel. Absolutely. Look, this lady right here, Naomi, has traveled the entire globe and met with all kinds of experts to learn about the most important issue facing our country today, and that's our health. My friend, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, calls her the wellness warrior, which is exactly the perfect name for you because that's exactly what she does. She relentlessly searches all over the planet for answers to the ultimate question. How do we live healthier, happier lives, free of disease, chronic illness, and obesity? And these are exactly the questions that we're asking ourselves. It's so confusing with the variety of different information that's out there to really understand what works for each of us and for our own health. Well, not only did you ask the questions, but now you're trying to give the answer, so let's get started. We should start talking about it. We've put together such a great group of experts. You've spoken to so many people around the world. Today, we're starting with Thomas DeLauer. Very interesting guy. I love Thomas's story because Thomas is a guy who was so obese that he was struggling and he had so much shame. And fast forward, he's on the front of men's fitness as what? a fitness model. That's his real story. But okay, so how did he accomplish this? Well, he's going to tell us. Okay, well, let's take a look at this. Really excited to have you here today. Can you tell me your name and a little bit about your background? Yeah, my name is uh, Thomas DeLauer and my background actually was in, believe it or not, the healthcare world. My background, even though it's not what you would see today on the internet, it's not what you would see when you watch my videos, but my background was a physician recruiter and actually had an ancillary lab services company. So a lot of what we did was provide lab services to uh, fee-for-service doctors, doctors that were providing services on a concierge basis to patients that were paying cash and not working with the insurance system. Uh, so that's how I got my start in the world of healthcare and alternative medicine, alternative really diet, if that's what you want to call it. Uh, from there, my life sort of transitioned into the social media world. Uh, I 
learned a lot through my own transformation, losing about 100 pounds. And Wait, wait, wait. Okay, so let me go back here for just a second. So you were working with the high-end concierge doctors yeah. that have access to absolutely everything because their patients want everything, right? Like Correct. the optimal health. So what did you experience in those years of working with concierge doctors? It was just the, the cream, like was it what you would see normally like if you went to a doctor's office? How different yeah, was so, it? So concierge medicine, uh, for those that don't know, concierge medicine is uh, where you are working with patients that don't want to be working with insurance, right? So they want to be paying their physicians cash because they feel like they're getting more of a, you know, quote unquote special treatment. But when you also have that situation, you have physicians that are not necessarily being incentivized even subconsciously by pharma or by, you know, the big industry or really just talking about um, the AMA in general, you know, what the American Medical Association has casted upon them as the right way, you know, those Newtonian physics kind of way of looking at medicine. So these, these physicians really had a different approach. And I don't like to call it alternative necessarily because that makes it sound a little hokey, mm -hmm. but these are doctors that truly had the best interests of their patients in mind because they were not doing it because insurance said this was the most expensive way to bill out a patient. Uh, does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So you are able to always sort of see the cream of the crop and, and the most cutting edge high performance health and well-being and medicine for these concierge patients. Definitely. Exactly. Got it. Okay. So your personal journey. So you did this work and then what happened? Yeah. So I went through my own transformation. So while I was in that generation where I was busy working a lot, I was overweight myself. I was about 280 pounds. And through time, I lost about 100 pounds over the course of a couple of years. Wow. So you were 100 pounds overweight and then you were on the front of men's fitness magazines how did this happen yeah it was definitely a, you know it was an interesting ride and, and being able to you know really set a goal for myself of saying okay once this starts once you start losing weight you feel so good you start you know really not wanting to change that at all you're, you've got so much momentum especially with a ketogenic diet you know it's like one foot in front of the other you're just losing weight you're feeling amazing you're gaining this cognitive function that you didn't have before you know, suddenly different things become illuminated in your life. Like, wait, I can accompl[ish] this. Wait, maybe I want to go after this too. You know, what? Eh, it'd be kind of cool to shoot a magazine cover. Let me just aim for that too. Wow. You know, and everything just becomes so clear, so crystal. And I really attribute that to just having that cognitive function that comes with with keto, because you're so foggy when you're not in ketosis and you don't even realize it. So being able to not only lose a ton of weight, but have the clear focus and the discipline to really go after some of the things that I've wanted to do since I was 12 years old. That's incredible. What was the moment, like, I'm, I'm so curious, when you were 280 pounds, was there a moment where you just decided, I want to lose weight? And did you come to the idea that, okay, I want to lose 100 pounds? Like, how did you sort of get to that place? Yeah, the, the interesting thing is I was always an athlete. So mm -hmm. even when I was overweight, I was still weight training a lot. And I think I just led myself to believe that I was just kind of on this endless bulk, you know, where it's like, oh, it's fine, I'm working out. No, it's just muscle. And then, you know, it was one day look in the mirror and say, this isn't muscle. <laughs> you know, who am I joking? And it's, uh, so it was at that point, you know, looking in the mirror saying, okay, if I want to be able to perform at my best in business, in life, but also with my own athletics and my own fitness, something needs to change. And when I first started losing a little bit of weight and understanding that, wow, I feel so much better. And I realized it wasn't because I was just getting healthier, but it was because I was harnessing the discipline of a diet that directly translated into the discipline of business and the discipline of everything else in my life. So it was really understanding that if I can just be clear on what I'm doing with my diet, I can start being clear on every other aspect of mm. my life. And it was just sort of a you know positive spiral from there on out. Had you ever done a diet before? Had you ever tried to lose weight before? Was this really the first time in your life? Yeah, I had, and that's actually what was kind of frustrating, to be honest, because it's a little bit polarizing from, from other stories, is I was an athlete before. I had been down that road before, but the thing was is that just like everybody else, I still become victim to life. Right. You know, and it doesn't matter how much of an athlete you are. It doesn't matter if you played sports in high school or in college and you were an all-star athlete life still happens and you get lost in the way of things and you start getting focused on other things, focused on your career. Some people get focused on their family, they get focused mm -hmm. on their spirituality, whatever, but they lose focus and they don't find that balance at a higher level that I always call it. You know, I look at it with uh, four pillars of life that you really should be focusing on if you want ultimate success. And you know, you're gonna have your health and fitness, you're gonna have your family, 
you're going to have your spirituality slash religion. And then of course, you're going to have your business because that is a part of your success and it is part of what defines you. And we can't joke and say that it's not because money drives so much of this world. And if you don't hold yourself to a certain standard, you're not going to feel good about yourself. But it's when one of those pillars becomes too strong or too weak, the whole foundation crumbles. So I'm not saying that health and fitness was the end-all be-all for me. It was just a piece that had sort of crumbled a little bit while other things were starting to raise up. So when I say find balance at a higher level, it was all about, well, how can I take my health and fitness and build it back up so that it's stable with everything else in my life? But little did I know that understanding ketosis didn't just rebuild my health pillar. It actually heightened all the pillars just because mm -hmm. of the cognitive awareness and everything that you're able to develop through it. What do you develop personally through embracing a ketogenic lifestyle that you noticed probably the fastest? What were the things you noticed? Well, I mean, to really make it simple, you have a lot more clarity. And it's just because normally when you go on a diet, you have so many variables coming at you. The thing I liked the most about the ketogenic diet was it freed up so much of my headspace to think about other things in life because it really is so simple. It's, you know, you're eliminating a major variable being sugar and carbohydrates. And just doing that, it doesn't occupy a lot of headspace. You know, normally when you're dieting, you're thinking about, how do I eat these six meals? Or I have to eat every two hours. Or, right. oh, I need to have this portion of this and this and this. I mean, ketosis was so simple. It made it so that I had the mind share. I had the space to be able to think about my family, to think about business. So despite all of the other physiological and cognitive benefits that happen with ketosis, I would say the simplest was just the fact that it opened up my lifestyle to something that was really achievable. And you say that ketosis is simple. So many people find it you know, overwhelming. They don't know where to get started. They're not sure, you know, is this food okay? Is that yeah. food okay? Can you share with us why ketosis is simple? Yeah. I mean, when we look at it, we have three variables that are always moving around with our diets. And if you talk to any diet coach out there, or any person that's on the internet, they're all going to tell you it's a perfectly balanced ratio of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Now, you and I both know there's a lot that goes into that. And it's more than just those three things. But when we're looking at ketosis, carbohydrates are essentially eliminated. So when we look at the big picture of it, we're really dealing with two variables, not three anymore. Mm. And what I mean by variables is if we're trying to juggle how many grams of protein we need to have, how many grams of fat we need to have, combined with how many grams of carbs we need to have at a specific point in time, pre-workout windows, post-workout windows, don't eat carbs before bed, don't eat this with breakfast, that's mind boggling. What if we were just able to say, if you just had proteins and fats and that was it, and you could eat those at any point in time throughout the course of the day, I mean, look how much easier that is. I mean, I'm not super good at math, but I could tell you that if we have three different macronutrients, there's a lot more different combinations of macronutrient ratios that we could have than if we were just eating proteins and fats, right? Removing that amount of weight of fat from your body over the course of a couple of years and all of the toxins that are part of that fat and doing it by really focusing on, you know, these two macronutrients, um, I can't imagine how incredibly difficult that would be, but it sounds like it really hasn't been that difficult for you. No, it, when it comes down to it, it was really a matter of just putting my mind to it. And again, yeah. eliminating that one variable, it's a straight shot. Um, it's a step over step with each time that you are really thriving in ketosis, each day that you're, you're feeling good and you're having that mental burst, you feel better and better each day. So it's not like it's hard to lose momentum. Right. I mean, your momentum's building. And as long as you're moving in the right direction, there's nothing that's gonna set you back. And the nice thing with ketosis, again, I mean, the, the weight loss can be accelerated so much because once you get your body truly burning body fat versus just you know, burning just a little bit of fatty acids now and then, it just steamrolls and the yeah. weight just comes off because that's the fuel source for your body. And again, you're getting your body utilizing fats and proteins. And if you have a predominant source of fat on your body, that's going to become the fuel source. So as an athlete, how do you look at the ketogenic diet and maintaining muscle and really focusing on being able to be an athlete? How does that relate for you? Yeah, you bring up actually a good point because uh, one thing that I, I deal with on the internet a lot is a lot of people saying that ketosis is not good for the athlete. You know, and people will say that yeah. day in and day out. And it's okay because most of, time, most of the time what we're understanding, what we're hearing out there is that we need carbohydrates for fuel. And it's been kind of ingrained in our system. It's ingrained in our brain that carbohydrates are what do it. But the fact is, is that there are so many different things that happen in your body when you're in ketosis. The simplest way that I can explain it, uh, Naomi, is when you have carbohydrates contain four calories per gram. Mm -hmm. Fats contain nine. 
Well, if you really think about it, if you've switched your body over from utilizing something that has four grams per cal or four calories per gram over to something that has nine calories per gram, that's a lot more energy density. So you're dealing with something that has much more energy per gram. So therefore, once your body is truly utilizing those fats, it's very, very energizing. You have a lot of energy for working out. You have a lot of fuel. And I think that people that feel that ketosis doesn't give you that athletic burst, they're usually people that haven't gone deep into ketosis and truly understand the benefits of burning fat as a source of fuel. If you were to describe sort of burning fat versus burning glucose for fuel, how would you, how would you describe that for us? Yeah, uh, I would simply say that burning fat is like burning jet fuel and burning carbohydrates like burning 87 octane fuel with a bunch of you know, cruddy additives that are gonna just make your system run poorly. Uh, so like if we had a car and we're putting gas in, how would, how would, it, how would it work? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, so you know, uh, I'm kind of aging myself here a little bit, but if you look at the old Volkswagen Bugs, they didn't have fuel gauges in them, right? Okay, so they used <laughs> to have, you just have to, you run out of gas and then you get a notification that it basically switches over to a reserve tank. Think of your body like that. You've got all these carbohydrates that are stored up in your body. That is your gasoline tank, okay? You've got 87 octane regular pump fuel in your body's fuel tank. But you have this magical reserve tank that has jet fuel in it. Mm. And if only you could tap into that reserve tank, then you could run on jet fuel and you could go super fast and you could feel amazing and you could just fly all over the country at warp speed and not have to stop and refill at fuel tanks all the time or fuel stations all the time. Okay, but let's take a look at what you have to do to get there. First and foremost, you have to burn through all of that fuel to be able to access the reserve tank. Mm. So you drain through that tank and then your body switches gears and now all of a sudden you've run out of carbohydrates, your 87 octane, and you're using fat. You're now using jet fuel. The only problem is in order to get there, you have to drain that fuel tank. And at the bottom of the fuel tank, you might have a little bit of sludge in there. My dad always told me, don't let your fuel tank get too low because it's gonna clog your injectors, ah. it's gonna clog your carburetor. You wanna make sure you always keep enough gas in there. So that scares people away at first because mm -hmm. they go low carb and they sit in that low carb area, but they never go past the low carb area and get into ketosis. And that's how you access the jet fuel. So people that are sitting in the low carb world and not necessarily going into the keto world, they are gonna have diminished performance. They aren't gonna feel good because they're running on sludge and their injectors are clogged. But if they push it just a little bit further and they do it right and they get their fats timed right and they really do their research, their bodies are gonna optimize and they're gonna drain that tank and you're gonna to go to that jet fuel and you'll never wanna go back. What are the keys to making sure you don't stay in that sludgy space? Like yeah. what would be the couple of things that you could share with us that would, that would prevent so many people from being in that space? Yeah. Number one, don't be afraid of fats. Don't be afraid of the fats. Okay. The fats are your fuel and you have to treat your body like you're priming a lawnmower. So you have to prime the pump with a lot of fats first so that the body gets adjusted to using those fats. And that's the, that's the number one thing, because people just, they get afraid of fats. We've all been conditioned to believe that fats are bad. So as soon as we start having to increase our fats, despite the fact that carbohydrates are low, kind of freak out a little bit. So if you want to get your body into that state, you have to prime it first. You have to teach your body that it's okay to have these fats. It's okay, you're not gonna die, you're not gonna hurt yourself. You're gonna have these fats and your body's gonna learn to run on them. You know, the second thing that's gonna be really, really important is make sure that you're dialed in for the first seven to 10 days, especially. When you're starting a ketogenic diet, it's, that's the most important time, the first seven to 10 days. I, I really think everyone should be disciplined on a ketogenic diet because it's pretty black and white anyway. Mm -hmm. you know, no carbs allowed, that's pretty simple. But when you're first transitioning to ketosis, that's the most important time. If you're gonna screw up, screw up after the 10 days because those 10 days are what allow your body to learn that that's how you're gonna run from now mm. on. You say, you know, fat, fat's our friend, it's a good thing. How do you look at all different types of fats? Yeah. So fats are interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, again, we've all been led to believe that fats are terrible. And the thing is, there's a small handful of fats that are bad that have given all fats a bad name. And that's the problem. And you know, those are the good old fashioned trans fats, mm -hmm. the non-naturally occurring trans fats. There are some trans fats that occur naturally, but the non-natural occurring trans fats, those are the things that are the hydrogenated fats, those things like that. Those are truly bad, but it's important that we know that those aren't natural fats. Those are adulterated. Mm -hmm. Those have had hydrogen molecules injected into the process to make a non-saturated fat a saturated. But that merits a quick explanation of a saturated versus an unsaturated. So let me explain that real quick. A saturated fat has multiple hydrogen bonds. 
meaning that there are so many hydrogen bonds that that fat is literally saturated. That's exactly why butter is solid at room temperature. Mm -hmm. It's exactly why coconut oil is solid above 72 degrees. And what I want you to understand with that is that that means it's stable. Okay, the more structure that it has, the more stable it is. It doesn't mean that it's just gonna immediately clog your arteries. It has nothing to do with that. It's a stable fat, okay? So then when we look at what's called a monounsaturated fat, that's gonna be something like avocado oil. Okay, so avocado oil is going to be a uh, monounsaturated that has one bond that does not have a hydrogen bond. So it's almost saturated. And when you have that, you have something that's very, very stable, but not quite as stable as a saturated mm -hmm. fat. Then we have the world of polyunsaturated fats. Okay? We have things like olive oil, we have things like canola oils, and all these other ones. Now, olive oil is good, and I'll explain something about it in a minute, but it's very fragile. But when you have a polyunsaturated, you have all these seats at the table that aren't occupied by a hydrogen. And what ends up happening with those is they can get occupied by oxygen and become oxidized. Mm -hmm. and they become toxic. So if you visualize a dinner table, and that dinner table is totally saturated with everyone sitting at the table, so that means there's no open seats available, that means that the boogeyman can't come in and take a seat. Mm -hmm. Meaning can't, someone can't sit at that table right. and turn everyone bad. If you have a monounsaturated, you have one seat available at the table, which means you have a very small chance, but still a chance, that a bad molecule, an oxygen molecule in this case, can sit at the table and make everyone go bad. If you have a polyunsaturated, you have multiple seats available. There's multiple seats that are open for a bad molecule to come in and occupy and make it bad. So the gist of what I'm saying is a saturated fat is the most stable. It's the most secure that is less likely to go rancid and go bad in your body. A monounsaturated is slightly likely to go rancid, but not that bad. A polyunsaturated is very unstable. We're talking about the canola oils and things like that. So no, not all fats are created equal, mm. but we have to understand how they really work in the body. Thank you. That was awesome. And it really helps to visualize, you know, 90% of us are visual people. And so that's a great visual. And I'm sure everybody that's hearing this and watching this is going to keep that in their mind. So thank you so totally. much for that. So with the polyunsaturated fats, um, how do you use them and, and how do you work with them to sort of protect your body? Yeah. So, so polyunsaturated fat, we just have to remember they're delicate little flowers. Yeah. Okay? We have to treat them like they're just super fragile. We don't want to, we don't want to disturb them. You know, they're, so. so which are your favorites of the polyunsaturated? Yeah. So I'd say, I mean, like an olive oil is going to be a yes. good one. That's okay. a very, very good one. And the thing with olive oil is it's high quality, but since it is so fragile, you never want to heat it. And you see people talking about cooking with olive yeah. oil. And I love it because people are taking a step in the right direction. That's great. That's totally better than cooking with you know, canola oil or some of these other oils. But the thing with olive oil is, although it's very healthy, it's unstable. It should be put on food that's room temperature or slightly warm. Because yeah. once it's heated, you're breaking apart. You're breaking apart that fragility of it and you're making it so that it actually goes rancid and it's not having a good effect in your body. So what do you say to people who want to do ketosis but maybe they don't want to eat meat and cheese the whole time. <laughs> no, you bring up another really good point because that's probably one of the biggest gripes that I have with uh, people understanding ketosis right now is they seem to think that it's all about eating meat and cheese. And yeah. that's just the thing is the true ketogenic diet should be more like a three to one or a four to one ratio of fats to protein. That's not a ton of protein. Yeah. You don't need to be eating copious amounts of protein. All that's gonna do is mess up your kidneys I and mean, you don't need to be consuming that much. So it's really a matter of getting more of the fats in, which you can get through perfectly healthy plant sources, avocado oil, macadamia nut oil, olive oil, coconut oil, palm oil, all these things that are great and awesome and plant-based. And then you can have small amounts of protein. You don't need to be eating the greasy burgers all the time. You don't need to go and get two ribeye steaks. Sure, you can do that from time to time with ketosis. That's kind of the benefit, but you don't need to be loading up with cheese and doing that. That's, that's the wrong way to do ketosis. That's, that's more like a modified Atkins diet, mm -hmm. which has sort of taken the world by storm as a form of ketosis, but it's more, it's more of a modified Atkins, which is quite a bit different. So if someone's a vegetarian or a vegan, what do you say if they want to be in a state of ketosis? There are lots of people that are, and, but, but is it that much more difficult? It's really not because the proteins that you can get from plant sources, as long as you are really being really diligent about getting your nice variety of amino acids mm -hmm. that you need to create a complete protein, and as long as you're paying attention to getting enough omega-3s, which can be difficult for some vegans and vegetarians, you're in a perfectly good position. Because if you're on a three to one or a four to one ratio of fats to protein, 
you're only, you're only gonna need 30, 40 grams of protein throughout the course of the day. Right. You can easily get that from a healthy pea protein source or from a chickpea protein source. It's not that hard. In fact, someone that is a vegan or a vegetarian doing ketosis, although they may have to work a tiny bit harder than someone else, they're gonna really reap the benefits because they get the anti-inflammatory effects of a plant-based diet, but they're also getting the anti-inflammatory effects of the ketogenic diet. So they're the ones that can benefit tenfold and unfortunately, because of what the mainstream has put out there about ketosis, they're not getting to experience it. And they're the ones that are really gonna win the most. So what else would you tell us that, that people just don't know about good fats, about, about ketogenics? Like what other pieces of information do you think we really need to know? Yeah, I mean, as far as the fats go, I, I mm -hmm. wanna touch on the saturated fats for one second because so many people think that saturated fats are bad. And there's a lot of emerging science that's starting to show that saturated fats aren't really the root problem. The problem is inflammation in the first place. And if you look at mm -hmm. most of the saturated fat studies, and I'm saying this only because it's something that I hear very, very often mm -hmm. is ketosis would be great for me, except I don't want to consume coconut oil or, you know, everyone says that coconut oil is bad now because it's saturated. So I want to make sure that this is covered because you know, saturated fats, the way that they break down in the body is different from the way that people think. You see, if we have inflammation in our arteries already, that's when saturated fats can become bad. So if we have a history of consuming a lot of sugar in conjunction with fats, that's when you're triggering inflammation mm -hmm. in the arterial wall. We have cells in our arteries and those cells have LDL receptors. And that LDL cholesterol is not necessarily bad, but what ends up happening is when the LDL actually reacts with the LDL receptor, Sometimes it can send a signal that triggers inflammation, and it's the inflammation that causes the issue in the artery, not the actual fat literally clogging mm -hmm. it. So it's important that people know that if you can reduce the inflammation in your body, which you can do by a ketogenic diet, and which you can do by reducing sugars, suddenly fats are much less ominous. So you talk about inflammation. Can you tell me a little bit more? Yeah, so inflammation, the simplest way to break it down, if you've ever uh, you know, bumped your elbow, you bumped your knee, or you've gotten a cut or a scrape, you know how it gets all swollen and red? Well, that, that's, that's known as acute inflammation. That's a form of inflammation, but it's happening very fast and it's happening in response to an injury. But we actually have what's called chronic inflammation that's occurring cellularly throughout our entire bodies. And it's usually in response to some kind of either trauma or something that we really shouldn't be putting in our bodies. And the problem with today's food, Naomi, is that so much of the food we shouldn't be consuming. Mm. There's so many additives, there's so many things. Sugar, glucose is inflammatory in and of itself, and it's triggering our cells to have this massive influx of inflammation. And it's making it so that our body's immune systems are having to focus on fighting the cut or scrape inside our bodies versus being able to help us become healthier. So our immune systems are suppressed, we're immunosuppressed, our bodies are always in this constant state of fighting a disease in our mm. body that we may or may not know exists. And if we walk around feeling really lethargic all the time and feeling foggy and feeling tired, there's a very good chance that inflammation is at the root of that. And we don't even know it because we see are seemingly healthy otherwise. We just have this little micro infection or these little things going on inside our body. And ketosis is so big when it comes down to modulating inflammation in the first place. That's one of the main reasons that my wife is on it, one of the main reasons that I'm on it today. So tell me about fasting and what is your relationship to fasting and what do you think is the best way to do it? Definitely. So it's a perfect transition. What a lot of people don't realize is that ketosis and fasting are almost the same thing. Mm. Fasting, obviously the big difference being that you're fasting, you're not eating, but the mechanism of action within the body is actually very similar. I don't know if you knew this, but the, uh, the ketogenic diet was discovered as a way to emulate or mimic fasting. Mm, yes. So it's, you know, if we go back to the 1920s, you know, we, we saw that doctors were struggling trying to find what this amazing thing that was happening in the body was when people would fast. You know, it was, we were finding lower instances of epilepsy. We were having neurodegenerative diseases that were correcting themselves through fasting. And these doctors were saying, well, okay, this is amazing, but what's going on in the body? Well, ultimately they find out that the common denominator is ketones are produced. And we produce ketones when we're obviously in ketosis, but we also produce ketones when we're fasting in mm. an even more accelerated rate. So fasting for so many different reasons is such a huge, huge, huge tool for just about anyone to use as a way to get healthy, not just lose weight, but to get healthy. And you use it as a value add. You use it not necessarily as a way of life, but as something that you insert into the process of whatever diet you're doing, whether it's ketogenic or not 
to use as a tool to be able to help your body accelerate whatever good process you're trying to get it to mm. do. So how do you fast and when do you fast? Yeah, so I take the word intermittent fasting to a different level. When people say intermittent fasting, they think that that means intermittent periods throughout the day that you're fasting. I look at that totally different. I look at intermittent fasting as fasting intermittently throughout the week or throughout the month. Fasting should be used intermittently. So me, for example, I'll fast two times per week, um, You know, usually about a 24 hour fast because I'm a believer in a longer term fast. And then once a month or once every couple of months, I'll extend it to about a 30 to a 36 hour fast where I just will try to extend it as long as I can. I don't push it really, really long just because I don't have much of a need to or desire to right now. Um, one thing that I've been interested in doing after diving into so much more research is to do more of a 48 to possibly even a 72 hour fast just to experience it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But I use fasting a couple days per week just as a tool to enhance the effects of the ketogenic diet that I'm already on. And when you're fasting, what are you doing during that time? Are you drinking water? Or tell us a little yeah, bit more. It depends who you talk to. And some people will say this is, is a, there's different sides of this coin for sure. But really the best way to fast is just consuming water. I mean, that's a true fast. And some will even say that that's breaking a fast because it still elicits a metabolic response within the body. But I'm a believer that keep the water in the picture. Mm -hmm. um, if someone's just starting out, and like when I was just starting out with fasting, uh, you know, black coffee and green tea were okay. You know, they, yeah, they technically can break a fast from a metabolic standpoint, but as far as body composition goes, and at least uh, thermodynamics and helping the body utilize fats for a source of fuel, they don't generally disrupt that process. But when you're talking about like the autophagy processes in the body and everything like that, trying to get the cells to actually regenerate and heal, you know, you're really going to want to stick to just water. But it's so much easier than you think, especially you know once those ketones kick in, once you're past the first 12, 14 hours of a fast, that's when the magic starts to happen. It's so easy. It's almost like you don't want to eat after that. So it's incredible to listen to you and you've just shared so much, so much information. I can't thank you enough. Awesome. No, it's been amazing to be here and any chance that I get to spread the word of ketosis, spread the word of fasting and help debunk some of the mainstream stuff out there and, and help people realize that sugar has been the problem, not fats, uh, then it's a good day for me. Awesome. Thank you. Wait, he was able to do all that and he's got a little baby too? Yeah, his That's little great. baby is adorable. And what I liked so much about him bringing his little baby actually to the interview was his baby is also ketogenic. And I think after more and more people watch the series, there'll be more ketogenic babies. <laughs>Thank you so much for being here. Can you tell me your name and a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm Dr. Mary Newport. I'm a neonatologist, mm. which is a physician that takes care of sick and premature newborns. And I practiced uh, in newborn intensive care units for about 30 years in Florida. Um, I was also a caregiver for my husband who had early onset Alzheimer's disease. So when you discovered that your husband had early onset, Alzheimer's disease, what, what as a woman went through your mind and, and how did you approach that? Oh, well, it was uh, devastating. Um, he started having memory problems. He was an accountant that worked oh. at home for my practice and um, he volunteered to do that so he could be there for our children, mm. which was awesome. Yeah. And then he started uh, having problems with doing accounting, making payroll mistakes and then forgot if he'd been to the bank in the post office, and it was obvious something was seriously wrong, and ultimately um, he was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease. And About when, when was that? Yeah, he was only 54 years oh. old at the time of diagnosis. So you think you're gonna spend your golden years together, and we have longevity on both sides of our family, mm. and. Uh, with Alzheimer's, it's about a seven-year prognosis on average, you know, that someone's expected to live on average about seven years. And we thought, well, we're not going to get to retire together and share our golden years together. So pretty devastating news, really, for both of us. So what did you do when you got that news? Um, well, you know, basically we did the best we could. <laughs> um, there's nothing treatment-wise for Alzheimer's in the medication department that works for more than maybe slowing it down for six mm -hmm. months or so. So we try the medications. And I was always on the outlook for clinical trials. Um, also nutrition, around 2006, I kind of caught on to, you know, this might have something to do with food. And so I started reading about that and we 
both decided to go from the convenience food diet to a Mediterranean diet. It was good for both of us, um, but it didn't slow down his Alzheimer's disease. As far as we could tell, he continued to get worse. So I was always looking for clinical trials. And um, right around 2008, there were two clinical trials that became available. So, um, what, what, tell us a little bit about those, yeah, those studies. Yeah, so in Alzheimer's, there's a problem where there's a buildup of plaques in the brain, this little protein deposits that, um, they're like waxy deposits mm -hmm. and they cause a lot of damage in the brain and they tend to accumulate in Alzheimer's and then they also develop tangles in the brain. So these two drugs were aimed at trying to prevent further buildup of the plaque, one of them, and the other one was a vaccine that would help remove this plaque. Mm. Very hopeful because the working theory at that time was that these caused Alzheimer's. And if you could get rid of them, the person most likely would improve. So the mice improved, and so they thought the humans would too. Unfortunately, that didn't turn out to be the case. Mm. But nonetheless, it was hope for us at the time. And so he was scheduled on two days in a row to be screened for these two different clinical trials. And the night before the first screening, I got on the internet, I'm looking for the risks and benefits of these two drugs, and I came across a press release for a medical food. It was called AC1202 at that point, and ultimately was called Axona. What is that? Um, it turns out that it's MCT oil, medium chain triglyceride oil. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. So um, I found this press release and basically it said that uh, it was a medical food that improved the memory and cognition in nearly half of the people with Alzheimer's that took it. And I thought, wow, you know, you don't ever hear that about Alzheimer's drugs. So I decided to try to find out more. And so I was able to find their patent application, which you can find on free patents online. And any US patent you can find and read the entire patent application. And this one was about 75 pages long. And as I read it, they talked first about that Alzheimer's is a type of diabetes of the brain, which was mm -hmm. a new idea to me. I hadn't heard about this before. And what happens in diabetes Alzheimer's? Diabetes of the brain. Diabetes of the brain. Is they this seem something called that, type three diabetes sometimes. Right, I've mm -hmm. heard about that. And, mm -hmm. and do you think that uh, that's well known and? It's becoming more yes. well known at that time, it really, wasn't there a lot of research going on, but it wasn't really making the news. Right. Was there wasn't really uh, much public awareness about it. And how do you translate this idea of diabetes of the brain? Mm, okay, so basically, there's a problem in certain areas of the brain that are affected by Alzheimer's with glucose getting into brain cells, and brain cells need fuel to function. And on a typical American diet or Western diet, you know, we tend to eat a lot of carbohydrate, and so our brain runs off glucose most of the time. And um, these areas of the brain affected by Alzheimer's have decreased glucose uptake, and this gets worse uh, as the disease progresses. It starts in a certain area, it spreads throughout the brain, it gets worse as it progresses until it's like encompasses the whole brain, and it's a problem of insulin deficiency and insulin resistance in the brain. So it's mm -hmm. much like type 2 diabetes, mm. um, except that you know people with Alzheimer's don't necessarily have either type 1 or type 2 diabetes right. at all, but their brain is affected somehow. So um, there have been studies looking back to people in their 20s whose family members had Alzheimer's that already in their 20s, they have decreased glucose uptake in those parts of the brain. So it's something that's going on for a long time before a person develops symptoms. They think at least 10 or 20 years, maybe longer. So um, this was kind of a fascinating idea to me. And the makers of the medical food came up with um, this idea because ketones are an alternative fuel for the brain to glucose. And when you consume medium chain triglyceride oil, your liver converts part of it to ketones. And the usual situation in which we make ketones is during fasting or starvation. Right. So this is kind of a, something that's an evolutionary <laughs> process. I mean, I think that has allowed humans to get to where we are today, that in the course of evolution, somehow our brains um, develop this ability to use ketones, um, our brains are about 2% of our body weight, but they use about 20 or 25% of our 
calories that we burn every day. It's extremely active. It needs a huge amount of energy. And so if you're fasting or starving, after about 24 or 36 hours, you use up the sugar that's stored in your body. And then your brain needs this alternative fuel. So if we didn't have fat, you would break down muscle and some amino acids convert to glucose, but you wouldn't last very long, maybe mm -hmm. 10 days or so, you know, because you would have to break down so much muscle. But we have fat, <laughs> and the fatter you are, the longer you live in this situation, mm -hmm. you're starving. But fat will break down into fatty acids, and those don't cross into the brain very well, but the muscles, heart, other organs can use them. However, um, fatty acids and liver are converted to ketones, and ketones are an alternative fuel for the brain. They cross easily the blood-brain barrier and provide fuel to these neurons that don't take up glucose normally. And um, Dr. Stephen Kunain, he's from uh, Sherbrooke University in Canada. He's been doing glucose and ketone PET scans. And this is more recent work. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know, you know, didn't, the work hadn't been done yet at that point that I'm learning about this, but he has found that the Alzheimer brain takes up ketones normally. Oh. Yeah, so the areas affected by glucose Huh. Those neurons, those cells can use ketones. Right. So it basically kind of supports this idea. So this medical food, um, now called Axona, is medium chain triglyceride oil that converts to ketones and can provide ketones as an alternative fuel to the brain. So this was a brilliant idea, mm -hmm. um, I thought. And the reason I knew what MCT oil was is because I'm a neonatologist. Um, back in the late 70s and early 80s, we used to add MCT oil to the feedings of our extremely tiny preemies. So these are babies that weighed under like two pounds. And we found that they absorbed it very well and they grew faster, but we didn't even think that it might have an effect on their brain at that point, but it probably did, <laughs> very possibly did. Um, so I thought, huh, this is something. I know it exists. You know, I know that it must be out there if we use it in our preemies. You know, they had bottles from the right. pharmacy that and, we and used. And doesn't breast milk also have some Yes, MCT? and breast milk, yeah. Breast milk contains medium-chain triglycerides. So in the um, mid-'80s, they started making premature infant formulas that contained medium-chain triglycerides. Oh. So we didn't have to add it anymore. Right. It was in the infant formula. And then... One of the interesting things that I learned from the patent application that I didn't know before was that medium chain triglyceride, those are um, extracted from coconut oil or palm kernel oil. Mm. And palm kernel oil is different than palm oil. Palm oil is from the outside of this little fruit, and the palm kernel is a white inside of, the, of this fruit. Um, is there one that you think is better? Well, the, the palm coconut? kernel has the more, more medium chain triglycerides. Oh, and like, do you look for mm -hmm. long chains or, or what? You're looking for medium chain triglycerides. Yes. So these, what, what those are, um, triglycerides uh, come in, well, the, uh, the fatty acids come in chains of carbons. Mm -hmm. So medium chain triglycerides are 6, 8, 10, and 12 carbons long. Depending on who you talk to, some people say it's um, 8 and 10, you know. Right. Um, depending, it's a matter of opinion. But and what the, do you say? Well, I, I think that um, that 6, 8, 10, and 12 are all medium chains. Lauric, the C12, which is lauric acid, is, mm -hmm. has some properties of both. So it's kind of on the fence there. But it has its own kind of unique properties. Um, it's it's antimicrobial. It's a remarkable yeah, fatty acid. acid. It's amazing yeah. how many people actually don't know. They don't know that. Yes. It's in a lot of um, skin products. It's yes. in a lot of, um, they use it in animal feeds to keep down growth of microorganisms. It's used, you know, really um, for many different I reasons. I use it when I get sick. Yeah. And, you know, when they say that human breast milk um, helps fight infection, there's stuff in it. Lauric acid is one of those. Uh, substances that they talk about that wow. helps control infection in the newborn. So, and you know, I didn't, had never heard of palm kernel oil actually mm. at the point that I was reading the patent application, but I knew I had seen coconut oil on the shelf right. in the health food stores. And you know, there's this myth, mythology that um, coconut oil is the artery clogging fat. So as a physician, I always thought, why is it on the shelf in a health right. food store? And you why know, is it? Well, <laughs> because that is just completely wrong. Is that, wait, so <laughs> completely wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It turns out that that really was, um, I think, a result of competition, corporate comp competition, mm -hmm. you know, when the hydrogenated, partially hydrogenated 
oils like Crisco came into being, they had a very long shelf life. That was their claim to fame, but coconut oil has at least a two-year shelf life, and it looks very similar. I mean, not very, but to Crisco, you know, it's a white oil right. at room temperature, and it was kind of their main competition, so they kind of came up with this idea, this notion, you know, and got this rumor started, you know, that it's the artery-clogging fat, and it turns out they had they just were loaded with trans fats, what they had, and they really are the artery clogging right. fats. Yeah. That's the irony of it, you know. But um, there are so many potential health benefits between the medium chain triglycerides, the lauric acid, antimicrobial activities. Um, it's uh, the medium chain triglycerides are thermogenic, they kind of raise your body temperature a little yes. bit. So they help keep, like, compare, like, if you ate the same quantity of oil, medium chain versus other oils, you wouldn't gain as much weight because. The part that's not converted to ketones is um, burned immediately as energy. It's not stored as fat. So um, there's a, a group in Japan that's been studying for 40 years and using it. They've been using it wow. for that reason, to keep accumulating body fat. They'll put some medium-chain triglycerides into their diet, which is very interesting. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. <laughs> there's been a lot of, well, not a lot. There's been a little bit of negative press out there about mm -hmm. coconut oil recently. What are your thoughts? Oh, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about that. I'd love to hear them. <laughs> yeah, well, the American Heart Association, they've, they've done this three times now. Um, officially. Uh, one was in 1961, uh, around uh, the not early 1980s, and just very recently. And the question is why? You know, why did they suddenly come out with this? And I think part of it is because of the popularity of, you know, coconut oil. It's kind of grown um, in awareness and popularity in uh, recent years. Um, there are connections to the soybean oil industry. Mm -hmm. um, I find it a bit ironic that the American Heart Association put their seal of approval on margarines that contain trans fats in the 1980s. They encourage everybody um, to stop eating butter and to eat margarines, and these margarines were loaded with trans fats. Um, I mean, just recently, they, they've taken the trans fats out of a lot wow. of margarines yeah. um, because the FDA has decided to ban <laughs> right. trans fats, so they're being phased out in the U.S., and they already have been banned in some other countries. So um, they, in this most recent article, they took four studies as their core studies that were from the 1950s. They were small studies. They were mostly men. They were in, um, I think, uh, at least two of them were in the U.S. And they were parts of the world that would not, clearly would not have been using coconut oil. And um, they were animal fats is what they were looking at, animal saturated fats, mm -hmm. which I, I don't think are a problem either. But um, when you look at the studies, you know, there there have been many more other studies since then and some fairly large studies um, that have shown that it's not a problem. Satur fat and even saturated fat are not a problem. There's um, an 18 country study that was just published this year, uh, over 130,000 people they looked at in 18 different countries. And they actually found that um, for all-cause mortality, the more fat you ate, the less likely you were to die from all causes. Wow. And that fat didn't really play a role in serious cardiac events. Saturated fat didn't play a role in uh, serious cardiac events. Mm -hmm. And even uh, there was a lower risk of stroke if you ate more fat and more saturated fat. It was like the exact opposite of what the American Heart Association has been saying all these years. Um, they found sugar was a problem. You know, sugar, uh, high sugar intake seemed to be a problem for, you know, having a higher than average mortality at a certain age. So, mm -hmm. you know, very interesting study, but it's the PURE study, P-U-R-E, 18 country study, and that's just one, but that's probably the biggest study, right. you know, that I've read about. So the other thing was they just kind of neglected, they, they made a statement in there that there have been no clinical trials of a direct effect of coconut oil or any other dietary oil on the heart. But because it supposedly raises LDL cholesterol, that was their basis for saying coconut oil is bad for your heart. So they had the graphs in there, and they had taken individual fatty acids, so they used lauric acid, separated it out from the rest of the coconut oil. They showed it was less than one point increase, like a fraction of a point wow. increase of LDL. And your LDL cholesterol, right. may average person will run 100 to 150. How could one fraction of a point make the difference between having a heart attack or not? 
and um, that, but huh. also it raised HDL fraction as well, you know. Right. So the studies that they were looking at were where you substitute lauric acid for sugar in the diet. You know, it was that kind of a study where you're substituting one thing for another thing in the diet too, you know. So it was kind of an odd study and, you know, to me it didn't, it didn't prove that there was any increase in heart disease, you know, from that. So, you know, it really, um, I, I think it was poor on their part. Uh, to do that. Um, the last time, the last two times they did that, they basically devastated the coconut oil industry right. on the other side of the world, in the Philippines and there's Thailand. There's been a huge and, impact even this time. Yeah. There's, there's a huge impact. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. for us as, as Americans, mm -hmm. we have to try so hard to improve our health because there's so many different influences coming from every direction. Mm -hmm. And for something like this to come out, Right, it's, it's it, extremely it's, negative. It frightens people. Yes. Right, and people that have been kind of on a healthy trend, they become afraid of it. Right. So you want to hear what happened to my husband? I do, <laughs> and I want to understand how the MCT yeah. oil became such a big part of mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. So, um, so I'm learning about this the night before he's screening for a clinical trial, and it's about 1 a.m. and I in the morning and he's scheduled at nine and I, there's not a thing I can do about it because I can't go out and get mm -hmm. coconut oil that time of the night. <laughs> I don't know any health food store. <laughs> so, but but um, so we went for the screening and there's a test called the mini mental status exam. It's a 30 point test where if you're normal, you'll get 30 points. Mm. And he needed to score at least 16 to qualify for the study. And he scored only 14. So he didn't get into the study. And we were devastated, oh. and um, the doctor asked him to draw a clock. It's a standard test for Alzheimer's disease. So what do you he, mean, draw a clock? He, well, you're supposed to draw a, a full circle with the, the 12 numbers around okay. it. Okay. And then they tell you the time to put in, so you put in the hands of the clock. Got it. And he um, drew just a few little small circles, random circles, not one big circle, and four numbers. Mm. And that was his clock. Mm -hmm. And it was so disorganized. and. She told me that he was on the verge of severe Alzheimer's, and you know that was really oh. frightening. And so on the way home, I thought, what do we have to lose? <laughs> <laughs> I saw, I had seen coconut oil. I didn't know I could get MCT oil over the counter, but it existed. I just didn't know it at that point. So I went and got coconut oil. When we got home, I had to kind of go back to my bio biochemistry 101 and learn what are the medium chain triglycerides. And then I was able to find a fatty acid composition of coconut oil on a USDA website. And I figured out how much coconut oil we would need to give him to equal that medical food. Wow. And so the next day he was scheduled for the screening at one in the afternoon. And so I gave him 35 um, mLs, which is a little over two tablespoons of coconut oil. And about three hours later, he went for the screening and this time he scored 18 out of 30 points, Eight. 14 the day before. Okay, time out for a yeah. second. In one, in less than 24 hours, yeah. two tablespoons of coconut yeah, oil? Yeah, three hours later, he gained four points. And it was things, we were at a completely different center. So it wasn't like he remembered. Wow. He remembered what town we were in, different town than the day before, what floor he was on that he couldn't remember the day before. Um, the day of the week and the season, he couldn't remember. Did you this feel like this did. was a miracle? Uh, did you yeah. expect that would happen? I, no. I mean, what were your thoughts? My, I didn't think anything would happen. Right. And, you know, I thought, was it just really good luck? I mean, at the time, sure. I didn't know. How could something work that fast? Right. How could it work that fast? But when they did the clinical trials for the Axona medical food, they had a pilot study where they, one dose, they oh. had one dose. They had a placebo day, and a, um, they had a day where they actually got the MCT oil. And just with a single dose, um, half, almost half the people had improved scores on their, their testing. So I thought, well, this is possible. <sighs> I had read that. So <clears throat> I thought, well, I don't know if it really was just really good luck or if it's really this, but we're going to keep it going. And so um, the next— did, did he have to draw the clock again? Well, two weeks later he did. Um, and, you know, basically, I kept a measured dose every morning at first, you know, where I gave him at least two tablespoons. And I just started cooking with it like crazy. Yes. <laughs> coconut, everything in our house, you know, was... flake coconut, coconut milk, everything you can think yes. of. It's great stuff, you know. <laughs> and um, he just started, He it's like he came to life again. You know, he had been very sluggish, barely talked in the morning, couldn't 
find a, a fork in the drawer, you know, uh, couldn't get water out of the dispenser in the refrigerator, and like almost right away he could do those things. Wow. And he had a tremor when he would talk, uh, when he would try to talk. Uh, and that went away, uh, never came back. He had um, a tremor in his hand when he would try to eat. And the only time we would see it, it was in the morning sometimes before he got his coconut oil. That kind of, that went away. Wow. He started walking better. He had been very slow. We couldn't pick up his feet and run. And over like a couple months, that came back. But the, uh, then depression, he was very depressed. That lifted. And he, he said it was like somebody turned a light switch on in his brain the day he started the coconut wow. oil, which was interesting. And did he have any of the side effects? But like you put him right on two tablespoons. Mm -hmm. Did he, did he, he go didn't. right his? He okay. didn't. And I, I took it the same day he did. I took yes. two tablespoons and I had like indigestion. <laughs> <laughs> but I've gotten used to it since yeah. then. I don't have a gallbladder. Do you still take it? <laughs> oh, yeah. I take loads of coconut oil and MCT oil. How much do you take a day? Uh, probably five or six tablespoons wow. at least sometimes more than that but he um, so two weeks after um, he started the coconut oil he drew another clock and this time it was a full circle all the numbers are there in the right order and there's a bazillion hands of the clock I don't know there were just a whole lot of hands yeah. but it was so much more complex oh. you know than the one the day before the coconut Gosh, oil you must have felt how did you feel I was shocked and pleasantly shocked yes. in a good way <laughs> yes and did you um, think about giving him a lot more than two tablespoons? Oh, like, yeah. here, chug this whole no, bottle. We, I did. I did. Because, you know, the medical food was tested for one dose a day, and the mm -hmm. FDA will only allow them to say it's one dose a day. If you test for one dose, that's all you can right. tell patients. And this was a prescription, a medical mm. food prescription. And I thought, you know, um, we, we ultimately did some levels. Dr. Richard Beach, who is... Um, um, an expert in ketones. He, he became very interested and involved in this and he wanted to do levels and we found with the MCT oil that his level would peak at about 90 minutes and the ketones were gone at three hours. And I thought, well, what does your brain do the other 21 hours? Right. So I thought, you know, we need to do this throughout the day. And right. so I added doses at dinner and then eventually at lunch and then before bedtime. And um, so he was getting it pretty much fairly close to around the clock. And I started mixing coconut and MCT oil because the levels were higher of ketones with MCT. With coconut, they were relatively low levels, but they seemed to have a longer duration. They would last six or seven hours. And I thought if we mix the two together and give him four doses a day, he should pretty much have a steady stream of ketones going. And that's what his brain needs, you know. And what did you do with his diet? Uh, did you um, modify that? So, well, yeah, we were already on the Mediterranean diet, mm -hmm. but he was eating a ton of fruit. And I think maybe his brain was craving glucose or something. Sure. Almost right away that stopped, and we were adding a lot of calories to his diet. So um, he, he started gaining a few little extra uh -huh. pounds there. But we substituted for other oils in the diet and then eliminated a lot of carbohydrates. So he just naturally started leaving the rice and the pasta and the bread, and so then we just kind of quit putting it on his plate, and it effectively put him on a ketogenic-type yes. diet. Remarkable, mm -hmm. remarkable. So where did it go after 90 days, 120 days? Yeah, so around 90 to 120, about three to four months, he had had a visual disturbance. He couldn't read for a year and a half, and he couldn't explain why. And then one day he says to me, I can read again. And I said, really? <laughs> why couldn't you read before? And he said, the words were shaking on the page yeah. when he looked, and that had just stopped. And he was able to read after that. And his comprehension wasn't so great then. But over time, his memory improved. And uh, about nine or 10 months after, he started remembering what he had read earlier in the day. And I just have one example where um, I had a doctor appointment. He was in the waiting room. And he um, there were Scientific Americans and other things there. And a few hours later, after we left, he said, I read this really interesting story in Scientific American about Einstein. He told me about it. And I'm wow. like, are you? kidding me? I mean, before we started this, he couldn't even finish a task. You know, I mean, he we're, we were trying to do gardening, and he couldn't remember if he was digging the hole, taking the dirt out, yeah. or putting it back in, and he couldn't do anything without, you know, me kind of directing him step by step through it. And now here, you know, he can remember what he read several hours earlier. So it was wow. really quite impressive, you know, over that first year. And, um, you know, and then things leveled off, and um, eventually he lost his battle with Alzheimer's. Eventually, Eventually, then. eight years later. But Remarkable. He became, um, Dr. Richard Veach that I mentioned, has a ketone ester, 
and we kept the coconut and MCT oil going, but um, he, Steve became a pilot study of one person. He's the first person in the world with Alzheimer's disease to get to try this um, ketone ester, right. and it was at a point where he was kind of having a setback, and it turned him around again for about another 20 months. It was amazing, and it was very quick, you know, the way um, the effect on him. So it was um, wow. quite, a, you know, I felt like we got um, probably at least maybe four extra good years that we might not have had, you know, if we just didn't have a happenstance, you know, uh, uh, just, you know, finding study. on the Internet of a press release. Well, it's a true story of inspiration and mm -hmm. and and your ability to to continue to forge forward, you know, despite the challenges that you were facing and mm -hmm. how remarkable. And probably when you think about the number of lives that you have impacted and, and you've written about this, can you tell me a little bit about it? Oh, yeah. Um, so when Steve improved so much, I was like overwhelmed because yeah. there are like 35 million people in the world dealing with Alzheimer's and wow. a lot more dealing with dementias, mm -hmm. <laughs> other types of dementia. And, you know, so I felt like I needed to tell everybody. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and, um, you know, I felt if he improved, other people will improve too. And so uh, I wrote to politicians and media people, I wrote to everybody letters, you know, when I was telling them. There's a medical food that's going to be coming out. My husband's an example of a, you know, somebody who improved, and this needs to be studied urgently. This information needs to get out to the public, and I got no response. Wow. Alzheimer's Association, you know, politicians, Sandra Day O'Connor, whose husband had Alzheimer's, she was part of an Alzheimer's study group, nothing. And then um, the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, about two months after Steve Improved was having their um, annual international conference. They have 5,000 researchers, and I thought, wow, this is a great opportunity. Maybe I can uh, inspire some of these and as PhDs a, to as do a this research and, right, and get this information out. So I wrote up a little case study, and you know, again, I was trying to encourage study of this. Um, he's just one case, but you know, other people will likely respond. and you know, about the medical food, about Dr. Veach's ketone ester, you know, which was lacking funding, still lacking funding. We're talking nine years later, he still can't get funding for clinical trials or mass production of it. You know, um, yeah, <laughs> this many years later. Um, so I wrote this article and I was going to um, pass it out in the exhibit hall at the Alzheimer's Association, just have a table with sure. my articles to give to these researchers. And they accepted it. And then three days before, they changed their mind, and they wouldn't let me. Um, Why would they do that? Why? What are your thoughts? I, well, um, the company with the medical food had an exhibit there, mm. and I thought, well, maybe they didn't like, you know, that I was <laughs> spilling the beans and telling mm -hmm. people they could get it on the shelf. Yeah. Because by then, I knew you could get MCT oil, too. So that might have had something to do with it. I don't know, um, but they wouldn't let me, and they, they didn't want me to pass any copies out, but they, they said I could come to the conference, and I did. I mean, I had tickets. We had everything. I had 1,500 copies of my article there in Chicago yes. printed up, and um, so I just gave out as many as I could, you know, and um, then just started a grassroots effort, um, get, uh, left them at health food stores, and then I started getting invitations to talk at health food stores, and then an article went in the um, St. Petersburg Times, mm -hmm. it's now the Tampa Bay Times, and that one got out. It had Steve's clocks. It had a picture of us with Steve's clocks, and that went viral. <laughs> I bet it did. And then I started hearing back from other people um, that were improving, too. And I've, uh, now I've personally gotten probably more than 400 emails of people that have had a positive response and with dementias, different memory problems, Parkinson's disease. Um, you know, other kind of rare diseases even yes. um, that have a problem with decreased glucose uptake in the brain or nerve cells. And um, so uh, I talked to Dr. Veach and I'm like, somehow we got to get funding for you. Yes. And do you Tell think us I should write a of... book? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. I said, do you think I should write a book? And, and he um, said, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> oh my gosh, 16 months it took me to write it. It was when I started looking at the ketone research, it, there was so much. And every time I'd read an article, there'd be four or five more references I needed to read. And I learned something new, and I just had to put it all in the book. So it took a long time to write. And then publishers are very slow, so it took a long time to get it published yes. after that. Tell us about the book a little bit. What is well, the name? And Yeah, it's called Alzheimer's Disease, What If There Was a Cure? Mm. The Story of Ketones. 
and um, you know the, the ketone ester. I know that MCT and the coconut oil improved Steve's symptoms. You know, was it a cure? Well, I didn't know, you know, how long was it going to hold them? And, you know, what if people take this as a preventive measure? Or what if they get it much earlier in the course of Alzheimer's disease? So there are clinical trials going on now about all of that, and some hopefully that will be started soon. But the ketone ester just, you know, has tremendous promise because the ketone levels can get quite a bit higher than what you could get with coconut and MCT oil. Can you tell us a little bit about ketone ester? What is it? Yeah, yeah. Many people don't know. So, um... The ketones, uh, there are three of them, beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and acetone, and you mostly exhale acetone. But um, beta-hydroxybutyrate is the one that, that climbs highest in the, the blood um, in, um, during starvation and fasting. And the ketogenic diet, when you stay on it for a period of time, will raise ketone levels that high. But if you take the ketone ester, it's instant, instant ketosis. It half hour, 60 minutes, you get the same levels that you get right. after being on a full-blown ketogenic diet for days. So, you know, it holds promise because, you know, if the brain and Alzheimer's can take up ketones, which we know now that they do, that it, it does, um, and you can get levels that high, you could potentially reverse somebody very quickly, you know, with Alzheimer's. and. Possibly it could be a cure, wow. you know. So um, are they safe? What are what are your well, thoughts? Well, there have been toxicity testing. Yes. And um, studied for five days in healthy individuals. Um, so that that's how they, they do those types of studies. And so it's proof for that use in, for five days in healthy individuals. So it really needs clinical testing in, in people that have, you know, these different conditions. Right. And, and um, but it's something that... You know, basically, you can take orally. How do you take it? Um, you just Some drink water. it. You just drink it. You drink it. Yeah, it has to be. It doesn't taste good. It tastes really bad. <laughs> I, I've tasted some that have some nice flavors to them, right? Right. So, um, yeah, and you might be thinking ketone salts, yes. which are a little bit different. So okay. there's different ways of combining the um, beta hydroxybutyrate ketone. Got it. Um, so that it can be taken orally. Okay. If you took it straight, it's too acidic, it would burn your stomach. Mm-hmm. So it has to be combined with something that can be taken orally. And Dr. Veach's cool idea, um, he binds the beta-hydroxybutyrate to butane diol, which when, they, when you consume it, the two molecules break apart and the butane diol converts to more beta-hydroxybutyrate. Oh, wow. Yeah. Is it on the market at all? Nope, oh. it is not. And, um, you know, so it still needs to be mass-produced and right. somebody to... You know, there, there's a way it's expensive, the way it's made um, currently in its lab, but there is um, a process that can greatly reduce the cost of it, a fermentation type of process. Mm. So he just, he needs a manufacturer that can, can do this. It. And, you know, and like an it, ethanol factory could do it, could be converted Interesting. To that. Is it mm-hmm. better than the salts? Like how, how would they it compare? It gets quite a bit higher levels. Um, you, like the ketone salts, well, if you're looking at levels, so... MCT oil, you might get 0.5 to 1 millimole. Ketone salts, possibly as high as 1.5, maybe 2 millimoles um, for an individual. Most people don't get that high. The ketone ester, easily 4 to 5 millimoles. Wow. So quite a bit higher. In one dose? One dose. Okay. Yeah. So it's like instant ketosis. (laughs) Um, So, you know, this needs to happen, and it's taken too long. (laughs) When I first met Dr. Veach, he thought it'd be in the market in four years, and that would have been 2012, and we're five wow. years past yeah. that now. So, um, you know, that's my great hope is that um, enough awareness will happen that some company will yes. <laughs> decide to do this and get it done. So all these millions of people that have these horrific uh, neurodegenerative diseases, you know, can benefit from it. And athletes, people interested in fitness and performance can benefit from it too. So there are a lot of studies, I mean, a number of studies now oh, yes. with that, with ketones and performance. Tell us just a little bit about it. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> Dr. Veach has an associate in, at Oxford, England, and her name's Kieran Clark. And she has studied Olympic rowers, and they've done some performance studies. And um, she had... Um, there was, they have found that it helps with endurance, not so much speed or sprint type uh, races, but endurance um, races. And they had, um, I think it was nine out of 10 of their Olympic rowers broke their own record with one dose 
of the ketone ester. That is remarkable. <laughs> so, you know, those kind of studies are out there. And um, there's a group in Tampa, the um, Dr. Jacob uh, Wilson and Ryan Lowry, um, they're at the um, Applied, let's see, ASPE, Applied Science and Performance Institute. And they're doing a lot of these studies now, uh, mainly with ketone salts. Mm -hmm. And they're working with world-class athletes and professional athletes and doing these studies. and just starting to publish some of these studies and they look really good. Such exciting mm -hmm. emerging science and mm -hmm. truly the, the, the science around MCT mm -hmm. oil from the time when you were working with little infants mm -hmm. and neonatal work to where it is today. Yeah, to where it is today. Who knew it had an right? effect on the brain like that? So <laughs> Dr. Newport, this is such fascinating information and I cannot thank you enough for sharing it with us. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for letting me spread this message. <laughs>Dr. Gundry is a remarkable, remarkable doctor. He and his partner had completed more pediatric heart transplants than any other physicians around the globe. Wow. And when he started to put on weight and become overweight over time, he decided to make a 180 degree turn in his life. He changed everything that he did, and that's what we're gonna hear about. See, again, it's so important to validate things like this when the person themselves has lived through it. Right. Honestly, take a look at the story. Dr. Gundry, thank you so much for being here. Could you give us a little bit of background about who you are and what it is that you do? Well, I'm Dr. Stephen Gundry. I'm a uh, heart surgeon who now actually teaches people how to reverse whatever disease they walk through the door with, with food and supplements. And I've been doing that now for about uh, 17 years. Wow. Could you tell us a little bit more about your history and your experience as a traditional heart surgeon? So I went undergraduate at Yale University, and then I did my medical school at Georgia, and then did most of my training at the University of Michigan, spent uh, two years as a fellow at the NIH, spent a year in pediatric heart surgery at Great Ormond Street in London, and then I was eventually recruited to be professor and chairman of cardiothoracic surgery at Loma Linda University here in Southern California. And I was lucky enough to partner up with uh, Leonard Bailey, and we did all the uh, infant and newborn baby heart transplants. Um, we've still done more together than anybody else in the world. And I also became famous for uh, operating on people that nobody else wanted to operate on. And that actually ended up changing my life because in the late 1990s, a gentleman from Miami, Florida, who I call Big Ed in my books, uh, was sent to me. He was 48 years old, big fat guy. He uh, had inoperable coronary artery disease. All the coronary arteries were clogged up. You couldn't put stents in them. You couldn't put bypasses because there wasn't any place to land a bypass. And these people would go around the country to various surgeons who were known for taking difficult cases. And so Big Ed had done this for about six months and everywhere he went, they said, can't do anything for you. You know, it's everybody's right. There's nothing we can do. So he'd been doing this for six months when he wound up at Loma Linda. And I looked at his angiogram, the movie of his heart from Miami six months earlier. And I'm going, you know, I agree with everybody else. I'm not gonna be able to help you. And he says, yeah, that's what everybody says, but here's the deal. He says, I've, I've been on a diet for the last six months and I've lost 45 pounds. Now this is a guy who was 265 when I met him, still big. And he says, I went to a health food store and I bought a bunch of supplements that I've been taking. And he literally brings in a shopping bag full of these things. He says, you know, maybe I did something in here. And I said, well, you know, good for you for losing weight, but that's not going to change anything here. And I know what you did with all those supplements. You made expensive urine, which I, I firmly believed at that time. So we get a new angiogram, and this guy has cleaned out 50% of the blockages in his heart in six months' time. Now, I'd never seen anything like that. Now, he still had blockages, 
But now there were places that were open that I could put a bypass in. So if I knew what I know now, I would have said, hey, great, let's keep doing this. But I wasn't that smart then. So I did a five-vessel bypass on him. And afterwards, the researcher in me said, tell me, tell me about this diet you've been on. And he starts talking, and about three sentences in, I go, wait a minute, time out. I had this crazy special major at Yale University back in the dark ages where we could actually design our own major. And we had to defend a thesis. And my thesis was that you could take a great ape, manipulate its food supply, and manipulate its environment, and predict you would create a human being. And I actually defended my thesis and got an honors, and I gave it to my parents and went off to medical school and kind of forgot all about it. And as Big Ed is describing his diet, I go, whoa, you know, wait a minute, this is my thesis at Yale. Now, why that's so interesting is that as I'm talking to Big Ed, I was an obese heart surgeon who weighed 228 pounds. Despite running 30 miles a week, doing half marathons, 5K, 10Ks on the weekends, going to the gym one hour every day, and eating a healthy, low-fat vegetarian diet because uh, Loma Linda is an Adventist institution. And I had high blood pressure, arthritis. I had to wear braces on my knees to run. I had migraine headaches when I did baby heart transplants. I don't recommend that. And high cholesterol and prediabetes. So he's telling me this story. And I go, wow. A lot of these supplements I had been using down in the lab to keep hearts alive and resuscitated for 48 hours after being dead for an hour and then transplanting them and literally resurrecting them. And I was giving them down the veins and arteries of the heart and it never occurred to me to swallow the dumb things. So I started swallowing a bunch of supplements and I started sending my blood work up to Berkeley and uh, I started on my diet that I described at Yale. So I lost 50 pounds my first year. I subsequently lost another 20 pounds and I've kept it off for 15 years. So I started my staff on this program and had similar results. I started my patients that I operated on on this program and their blood pressures normalized and their diabetes went away and their arthritis went away. And after about a year of doing this at Loma Linda, I looked in the mirror and I said, you know, I can't do what I'm doing anymore because I shouldn't be operating on these people and then teaching them how to eat. I should teach them how to eat and then I won't have to operate on them. So I, I actually resigned my position and I came out to Palm Springs and set up an office where all I asked people to do is that every three months, I want to draw a bunch of blood on you that insurance will pay for, and I want to tell you to remove certain things from your diet, and I want you to go buy some supplements at Costco or Trader Joe's or a health food store. I didn't sell them. So for the last 15 years, that's exactly what I've been doing. And very soon, patterns appeared of what we asked people to eat and what supplements they were taking and changes in blood work and changes in them. And that resulted in my first book, uh, which was Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution, uh, which we published in 2008. And after that book was published, uh, a lot of people with autoimmune diseases started showing up uh, here. When these people with autoimmune diseases came in, within three to six months, the markers of their autoimmune diseases all went down to normal. And I've published several papers on that. In fact, I have a paper coming up in March at the American Heart Association of 102 people with uh, biomarker proven autoimmune disease, things like MS, like lupus, like rheumatoid arthritis, like Sjogren's syndrome. And uh, within six months, all of their biomarkers are normal, return to normal, without medications. And I would have thought that that was impossible, but 
I see it, you know, every three months we see this happen. You mentioned your paper with the American Heart Association. Would you tell us a little bit more about your experience there? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I was a president of the desert chapter of the American Heart Association for two years, a few years ago. And one of the unfortunate things about uh, professional organizations like this is that they hoe to a, a party line that um, unfortunately gets a lot of contributions from uh, big agriculture, big pharma, um, big chemical, and they don't, I think, really know what's happening at the grassroots level anymore. So going all the way back to the beginning, what were the steps that you took to change your diet? Well, you know, I actually grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, and uh, in Omaha at that time, it was the world's largest stockyards, and cattle and pigs were brought to Omaha and put in pens and then fed uh, whole grains and soybeans, primarily corn, wheat, and soybeans and they were fattened up for slaughter. In fact, uh, I, when I went to Loma Linda, uh, I changed my diet to a healthy whole grain and whole bean diet from the diet that I had been following before, which was quite the reverse of that, to improve my health. And I should have been smart enough as a good old Omaha boy to realize that healthy whole grains and beans were the way we fatten animals for slaughter. And I was just fattening myself for slaughter. So what Big Ed had done is he had figured out that the traditional advice to be healthy in the American diet was in fact making him incredibly unhealthy. And what happened to him, and has happened to thousands of people that I've reported on, that if we take away certain components in their healthy diet that's actually damaging the lining of their blood vessels, that it's making them pre-diabetic or diabetic or insulin resistant, and that are actually changing the gut microbiome, the bugs that live in our intestines, then their body actually has the ability to heal itself. And this was actually uh, Hippocrates, you know, the father of medicine, you know, 2,500 years ago, he used to say that any creature has an innate ability to have perfect health. And he called it a green life force energy. Kind of hokey, but that's what he called it. And the purpose of a physician was to identify the external factors that were preventing that person from healing itself and to remove those factors, and then the body would take care of itself. And the longer I've been doing this, uh, he was absolutely right. So all I am now is a detective that finds out what are those factors that's preventing my patient from healing himself, and then teach the patient to take those factors away from them, and they'll take care of everything else. I don't have to do a thing after that. And so one of the things I do uh, is study cultures and figure out, okay, how did they deal with certain plant toxins that they knew were bad for them, but they knew they had to eat to get calories. And that's where I started investigating lectins. You spoke about vegetables and lectins. How is it as a society that we got to the point where we thought all vegetables are good for us? You know, uh, we were taught that plants were put on this earth to nourish us. If we look from evolution, they were here for about 80 million years on earth before animals, uh, insects arrived. So they had it really good before animals arrived because nobody wanted to eat them. And we have to understand that a plant has a life and plants do not want to be eaten. They want to grow and they want to see their babies, their seeds grow. Just the principle of evolution applies to plants as well. So when animals arrived, they had a problem because plants were stationary. But what they could do is they're chemists of incredible ability. So 
they use chemical and biologic warfare to make or dissuade their predator from eating them by either paralyzing the predator, by poisoning their brain, making their brain not work properly, actually making them depressed or anxious, or making them hurt. Now, a smart predator says, you know, every time I eat this plant or this plant baby, uh, I don't feel very good, I'm not reproducing as well, I'm going to go eat something else. The plant wins, the animal wins, everybody's happy. Then humans arrive. The problem with humans, as all of us know, is we're pretty stupid. So when we eat things that make us hurt or make me put braces on my knees so I can keep running or take a Prilosec or Nexium so I can eat a pizza pizza without having heartburn, I am not smart enough to realize the plant is actually trying to get my attention. And if I'd pay attention, I wouldn't do those things. I always remind myself that if somebody's telling me they're taking Nexium or Prilosec or chewing Tums for their heartburn, that if I just take away the thing, the plant foods that they're eating that's causing it, their heartburn will be gone. And we see this over and over again. And so lectins are one of the main plant defense systems. And what are lectins? Lectins are a protein that likes to stick to sugar molecules, and they're sometimes called sticky proteins. They were discovered in the late 1880s as a way of typing blood. And it turns out that blood types are determined by taking a lectin and throwing them in some blood, and the blood cells agglutinate. They all stick together because they're bound together by these lectins. And depending on the lectin that you put into the blood, you can tell whether somebody's a type O or a type A or a B. Now, interestingly enough, that's one of the main defense systems of plants. So, for instance, five raw kidney beans or five raw black beans, if you eat them, will actually, in many people, agglutinate their blood, could cause your blood to clot. My research and a lot of other people's research has shown that Lectins, particularly a lectin in wheat, called wheat germ agglutinin, and there's that word agglutinate again, actually attracts our immune system to attack the lining of our blood vessels. And now we're coming full circle around to why maybe healthy whole grains aren't a good idea if you want to have good health. So what kind of foods are we often eating that have lectins, and what are you having your patients avoid? Yeah, so human beings actually did really well uh, up until 10,000 years ago. We ate primarily a diet of leaves and tubers like, like sweet potatoes or yams. And we actually ate a lot of fish and shellfish. It's a subject of an upcoming book. And yeah, we ate animals as well. But 10,000 years ago, with climate change, uh, the glaciers disappeared and we entered a warming period where all the big animals like mastodons and elephants disappeared. And we started growing crops and we started growing grains and then we started growing beans. Now, there's no evidence that any great ape has ever eaten grains or beans because they're so toxic with lectins that unless you cook them, they're quite lethal. So we started growing grains and beans. Uh, human beings shrunk almost a foot in 2,000 years after we started uh, growing uh, grains and beans and eating them. And our brain actually shrunk 15% uh, from its high, and we actually have yet to ca catch up. So that was a major change in human diet, grains and beans. And it's documented in the uh, record of anthropology and archaeology. The second thing that happened is that 2,000 years ago, northern European cows suffered a genetic mutation. And they made a lectin-like protein in their milk called casein A1. Uh, casein A1 is a lectin that attacks to the pancreas, uh, which makes insulin. And there's really good research coming out, particularly China, that casein A1 is a major cause of type 1 or juvenile diabetes. And incidentally, we're seeing 
a huge increase of juvenile diabetes, type 1 diabetes in adults, and a lot of it's laid at casein A1. Back to casein A1. Casein A1 cows are hardier, they give more milk, so that almost all cows in the world, including ours, are the wrong breed of cow. The right breed of cow is casein A2 cows. They still exist in southern Europe, uh, in France, Italy, Switzerland, but northern European cows, Australian cows, New Zealand cows, American cows are all the wrong breed. Even if they're grass-fed, they still have a lectin, casein A1. Most people I've found who think they're sensitive to milk or they're lactose intolerant, they're actually sensitive to casein A1. Um, third thing that happened was that 500 years ago, all of us for the first time were exposed to American lectins. And some of them are really surprising. In the nightshade family, potatoes, eggplant, tomatoes, peppers, and goji berries. Goji berries are not from China. They're actually American. They were taken to China in trade and they flourish. They were called the wolfberry in, in, in America. And then the American seeds and nuts. So pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, chia seeds, and the American beans, peanuts and cashews. Peanuts are a bean, they're not a nut, and they are nasty for making us attack our blood vessels. Cashews, the darling of everybody right now, are actually part of the poison ivy family. And the dermatologic literature is full of examples where rashes and upset stomachs were actually caused by people eating cashews. In fact, cashew pickers actually have burns on their hands from the lectins and cashews. So you wouldn't believe the number of people with rheumatoid arthritis that I see that cashews is one of their big mischief makers. So your practice began to grow as you started to get major and incredible results with your autoimmune patients and really experimenting with them. Have you seen any other results with cancer patients, with other disease states, and can you tell us a little more? Yeah, so I see a lot of cancer patients now, uh, primarily stage three or stage four cancer patients, but uh, we've had quite good success with uh, prostate cancer. I'll give you an example. Uh, I have a gentleman who we feature in, in the next book who's actually contributed a bunch of recipes to the Plant Paradox cookbook, which will be out in April. And uh, he's now, uh, I think this is his fourth year out, with a aggressive prostate cancer that has actually shrunk in size over the past four years without any treatment except diet. And it's still there, we can still see it, but it continues to shrink and it's, it was very aggressive before. So what we found is that cancer has an Achilles heel that uh, a German physician, Otto Warburg, discovered in the 1930s. And Dr. Warburg actually won two Nobel Prizes for medicine. What Dr. Warburg found was that cancer cells have decided to use sugar in a pathway called the fermentation pathway. We ferment beer, we ferment wine with bacteria or yeast, and they use the sugar without burning oxygen. You and I burn sugar with using oxygen, and it's incredibly efficient. But uh, single-celled organisms like yeast and bacteria use a very inefficient system of using sugar. What that meant was the cancer cell needs far more sugar to grow and divide than a normal cell. In fact, somewhere between 8 and 40 fold as much sugar to accomplish the same growth. Now, Dr. Warburg thought it was a genetic mutation that caused that, and uh, he was actually mistaken. We now know that the cancer cell actually chooses to use that pathway. It still has the other pathway available, but it chooses that pathway. But his, his realization was correct that cancer cells need a whole lot more sugar than a normal cell. The other thing that he found is that fructose, the sugar in fruit, is far more desirable to a cancer cell uh, 
than glucose, the other sugar. And one of the things that I did very early on in my cancer practice is take fruit away from patients with cancer and also seeded vegetables because any vegetable with a seed is actually a fruit. So a cucumber is not a vegetable, it's a fruit. A squash is not a vegetable, it's a fruit. A tomato is not a vegetable, it's a fruit. So we took all fruits and seeded vegetables away from our cancer patients. The other thing that he discovered is that all of our cells have an alternative pathway of using a type of fat called ketones. And most people have now heard of the ketogenic diet where our cells, including our brain, are perfectly capable of burning a type of fat that's called a ketone as if it was sugar. But cancer cells don't have the ability to burn ketones for fuel. They have to have sugar. So his idea, which is still gaining more and more acceptance, is that you can starve them of sugar and use your own fat as a fuel or alternatively take fats that have ketones in them and in theory uh, have cancer have nothing to grow with. And so that's what, what I use. Uh, we have obviously a few tweaks and everybody's got a few tweaks, but the idea of a ketogenic diet for cancer um, is now in some clinical trials at institutions and is well worth looking into. And I, I talk about a number of the patients in the plant paradox who have successfully done this. Dr. Gundry, when you started down the path of moving away from the low-fat diets, what was the reaction of all your other peers? As time goes on, you're, you're obviously you're treated as wow, this guy's really wacko, and you know, he was a great surgeon, it's too bad what's happened to him, because um, you know, he obviously just fell off the deep end, poor guy. But, but now, people come to me for advice, uh, doctors fly in here and spend a week with me getting trained to figure out what's going on. But, but I'll give you an example. Um, years ago, particularly with my autoimmune patients, I noticed that they had very low levels of vitamin D and consistently. And I said, hmm, that's interesting. They have very low levels of vitamin D. And there's, there's good history that autoimmune disease is much higher in northern climates than it is in near the equator in the, in the Mediterranean. And there was always a supposition that sunlight was somehow driving part of this problem. So I started aggressively giving people vitamin D and it shocked me how much vitamin D I would have to give people to get a, a decent level of vitamin D. But I started doing that because, oh gosh, at least 10 years ago, I measure vitamin D on everybody. And I saw an, an older couple in their late 70s and they were measuring vitamin D and their, their vitamin D levels were 270 nanograms per milliliter. Now, supposedly, above 100 is toxic. And so I'm looking at these people going, first of all, I'm going, why aren't you dead? And, and I'm going, okay, this is toxic level of vitamin D, and that's supposed to cause neuropathy. You can't feel your fingers. And I said, yeah, you know, feel your fingers okay? Yeah, why? And I, and I said, well, you know, this doesn't make any sense. You, you should be dead. This is toxic. I said, how long have you been doing this? And they said, oh, my gosh, doc. You know, everybody knows that vitamin D, you have to have huge high levels. It's, it's one of the greatest, you know, vitamins there is. And I'm going, really? And they said, yeah, we've probably been doing this for 20 years. And, and you're not dead. So I don't give anybody anything that I won't try on myself first supplement, anything. So I started pushing my vitamin D levels up to above 120. And I've done that for 10 years now, and I do it more than nothing, anything just to prove that I'm not dead yet. And so with my autoimmune patients, I would start pushing their vitamin D up to at least 100. And it might take 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 international units a day to get their vitamin D level 
up. So only in the last few months, there have been amazing accumulation of literature that one of the real mischief maker actors in autoimmune disease is what's called a T cell. It's a white blood cell that is resistant to the effect of vitamin D in autoimmune patients. Normally vitamin D makes the T cell calm down and relax and not go get interested in attacking anybody. And some beautiful new research shows that autoimmune patients, the T cell doesn't listen to vitamin D unless you have very high levels. So just from an observation standpoint, from for over 10 years now, I was lucky enough to make a connection that this low level of vitamin D and pushing it up to a very high level was helping my patients with autoimmune disease. And a recent paper, getting back to this older couple, shows that the higher your level of vitamin D, the longer your telomeres are as you get older. And long telomeres, of course, are one of the secrets of successful aging. And lo and behold, it turns out a human study shows that those people with the highest levels of vitamin D have longer telomeres compared to the people who have the lowest levels of vitamin D. So vitamin D is really good for you, and you don't have to be afraid of it. So let's talk about no fat, low fat, even the good fats, and the wave that we're on right now and how that came to be. I want to go all the way back to cholesterol and statins. You know, Ansel Keys was really one of the main figures in the low fat movement. So Ansel Keys uh, did a study, uh, which is infamously called the Seven Country Study. He actually studied 20, 21 countries. And he looked at the things they eat. Now this was post-war, World War II Europe, and uh, also Japan. And he made a, an interesting graph. He cherry-picked his points that suggested, and in his mind strongly proved, that the more saturated fat that was in a country's diet, the higher the rate of heart disease, and the less saturated fat in the diet, the lower the rate of heart disease. And that had a huge influence in the 1960s on the McGovern Commission, who were charged with setting new dietary guidelines for the United States. Now, coinciding with that, uh, the nutritionists at Harvard, we now know, uh, were being paid large sums of money from the sugar industry to prove that fat was the cause of heart disease and that sugar, in fact, was not even associated with heart disease. All this came together in the McGovern Commission that said Americans must follow a low-fat, basically high-carbohydrate diet to prevent heart disease. And couple that with uh, the Department of Agriculture wanting to increase farm production, we were bombarded with huge amounts of products that were based on corn and wheat and grains that farmers could get a subsidy for. And things like coconut oil or saturated fat from animals was, you know, the anathema of what we should eat. If you look back, you can actually see that there is an increasing trend from that moment onward in the rates of obesity and diabetes that track beautifully our carbohydrate consumption, even though our fat consumption was going down. And the rates of heart disease, rather than going down, continued to go up. So uh, the American Heart Association and the American Coll College of Cardiology met, they, they had eight physicians, several of whom I know, who were charged with making cholesterol guidelines, that cholesterol must be the evil culprit that's causing heart disease, and that we need to get cholesterol down. Early on in my practice, it was primarily to treat heart disease, because I'm a heart surgeon. And I noticed that my patients who were eating a healthy, low-fat diet 
had a fat in their bloodstream called triglycerides. And triglycerides are actually the first form of fat that we make from sugars and starches. It doesn't come from eating fat. I could put you on a 100% fat diet and your triglycerides would be 20. So when I started looking at the guidelines of what triglycerides should be, the upper limit is 150. Now, I'll use a personal example. Uh, when I started my program, I had a triglycerides of 166. Little above normal, eh, nothing to be worried about. I had an LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol, also of 166. Now, it's supposed to be below 100. My HDL, the good cholesterol, was 32. And I can tell you that's really low. And I was told that, oh, you poor guy, uh, your dad has the same profile and it's genetics and there's nothing you can do about it. And we should put you on a statin drug to lower your LDL. So when I met Big Ed and I put myself on a program where I really cut out simple carbohydrates, cut out fruit, started eating a lot of avocados, started pouring olive oil on everything and Many people know me as the doc who says the only purpose of food is to get olive oil into your mouth. Um, so when I did that, and I did my first blood work, my triglycerides of 166 had dropped to 30. My LDL had dropped from 166 to 76. And my HDL, which I was told was genetically low, went from 32 to 80. Now that's impossible because I have the same genes that I had when I had that previous profile. But what I did and what I instruct my patients to do is I want you to eat like it's actually the dead of winter. And winter is a time when we actually use up all the fat we've stored. Um, and when you do that, you will see that everything will reverse your HDL, which is basically a recycling truck, will go up because you're carrying fat around your body that you've had. And your LDL, which is actually a moving van for triglycerides, for sugars and starches, will plummet. And we see that in thousands, tens of thousands of people. I've reported it in national meetings at the American Heart Association that our dietary recommendations are 180 degrees wrong. Now, why are they wrong? Because quite frankly, if we follow the recommendations, you will absolutely need a statin drug to get your LDL within goal. And that's not what we need to be doing. The vast majority I see, and my colleagues in cardiology see, who have a new heart attack, their LDL is perfectly normal because of the statin drug they're taking, but their HDL, the good cholesterol, the one that goes around and cleans out your blood vessels, is still low because the patients still have a high triglyceride. And what I do is we want people's HDL to be at least equal to triglycerides and preferably higher. And when we see that, we start seeing regression of coronary artery, artery disease. So I hear that you have a story about Michael DeBakey. So uh, I had the, the, the real honor and pleasure to know Michael DeBakey. I got to speak at his society on several occasions. And he's one of the true greats and pioneers in, in heart surgery and vascular surgery. And very early on in the 50s, uh, Dr. DeBakey, after looking at you know, tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people's aortas and blood vessels, uh, and seeing all this cholesterol plaque, uh, was very adamant that cholesterol had nothing to do with causing heart disease, even though that, that's what everybody saw there. Through the years, as, as my career shifted, uh, I realized how smart, you know, he was. Smart guys are usually smart in lots of things. And as I tell, as I tell patients or anyone who will listen that if I'm an alien observing planet Earth and reporting back to high command, 
uh, of my observations. One of my observations, which would be correct, is that I'm pretty sure that ambulances cause car wrecks because every time I see a car wreck, there's an ambulance. So the ambulance probably caused the car wreck. That would be a correct conclusion from my observation. But in fact, DeBakey was probably right. If we think of cholesterol as an ambulance that happens to be at the scene of a battle that's going on between our immune system and the wall of a blood vessel, then perhaps cholesterol is there to take away the casualties and gets caught up in the battle. And so all I can tell you is DeBakey a very smart, was a very smart man and we should have listened to him a long time ago. And I think our concept that the cholesterol was actually the bad actor uh, is, is a big mistake. And it, actually it's inflammation on the wall of the blood vessel that causes the attraction of cholesterol in the first place. And if we get rid of the inflammation, is what I do with taking food away from people, that uh, it goes away. So what I actually want people to envision when they think about heart disease is imagine you get a splinter in your finger and you get this big red area around. Those are your white blood cells coming around to attack that foreign body. So imagine if we're eating splinters that get into our bloodstream and you can prove easily that wheat germ gluten gets into your bloodstream, another lectin, that our blood cell, our white blood cells are attacking the wall of our blood vessel and cholesterol is coming around to help out take away the casualties. And that's where heart disease comes from. One thing that I found very surprising about your program is that you're extremely pro-vegetable yet there's an actual plant paradox going on. Yeah, that's the, the reason the book's called The Plant Paradox is that plants can absolutely save your life and they can absolutely kill you. And you gotta know who your friends are and who your enemies are. And it's actually easy to understand that we've, we've had millions of years of evolution in eating plants. And the longer we've been eating particular plants, the longer our Immune, our immune system has been taught by the bacteria that live in us, hey, we know these plants, you know, we've known them for millions of years. You don't have to get all worried about these guys. You know, we've got this handled, we've evolved to eat these lectins and take, just relax. But the shorter the period of time that we've been exposed to a plant, the less our bacteria have evolved to handle them and the less our immune system understands these foreign bodies. So a lot of it, I just go back and say, okay, you know, what did we eat 100,000 years ago that we're eating, that we're not eating now? And just ask people to go back in time. And one of the things that I talk about a lot in The Plant Paradox is if you look at the longest living peoples around the world, the blue zones, and I was a professor in a blue zone uh, at Loma Linda University. The thing that unites all those different cultures is not that they're eating grains and beans. Uh, I'm sorry, Dan, it's not the reuniting feature. The uniting feature is they have very limited animal protein. And it breaks my heart coming from Omaha, Nebraska, that animal protein, if you want to have an extended lifespan, is detrimental to extended lifespan and health span. And I go spend a whole chapter on it, on why this is happening. And there's my next book uh, will be on this paradox of how plants may be the way to extend our lifespan and limited animal protein is the, is the way to go. So that's the real paradox. There's certain plants that will absolutely save your life. There's absolutely certain plant-based fats like olive oil, like macadamia nut oil, like avocado oil, like avocados that are fantastic for you. But there's other plants that don't like us and we're best avoiding them. If you could reach out to everyone in America and tell them what would make the very biggest impact on their health, what would that message be? Yeah, 
please get your vitamin D level up to about 100 nanograms per milliliter and don't be afraid of vitamin D. Vitamin D is the, probably the most important hormone. It's not a vitamin, it's a hormone that you can take to save your life. Number two, we have a profound efficiency in fish oil in our bodies. If you wanna have a great brain, if you wanna have a great mood, you absolutely have to have a lot of fish oil. There's beautiful studies now in aging that show that people who have the highest, what's called the omega-3 index, have the largest brains and the largest areas of memory compared to the people with the lowest levels who have the most shrunken brains and the smallest areas of memory. Number three, the only purpose of food is to get olive oil into your mouth. Studies in Spain over five years with 65 year old people forcing them to use a liter of olive oil per week. That's a lot of olive oil, that's more than this per week show, compared to a low-fat Mediterranean diet, show that at the end of five years they had better memory, they had less cancer, and they had less heart disease than a low-fat Mediterranean diet at the end of five years. More olive oil. Number three, get rid of grains and beans out of your life. If you have to have beans, buy a pressure cooker. A pressure cooker like an Instapot will save your life because it kills all lectins except for the gluten lectin in wheat, rye, and barley. Uh, number four, if you are going to eat nightshades, either put them in a pressure cooker or peel and de-seed them. Number five, fruit should only be eaten in season. It should only come from a local source. Your brain does not understand that a blueberry can be brought from Chile in February uh, to Costco, and you're not supposed to be eating blueberries in February. One of the big things that I see in obesity in this country is fruit consumption causes obesity. The next thing, probably the final thing, is reduce the amount of animal protein that you eat. And there is a funny sugar molecule in beef, lamb, and pork that causes us to have an autoimmune attack on our blood vessels. It's, it's got a funny name called new 5 gc I talk about it in the book. And again, I came from Omaha, and I'm sorry to tell you this, uh, but those are the factors. And if you do that, uh, you watch what happens. It's amazing. And I get to see it every day. Thank you so much, Dr. Gundry. This was fascinating, and I really appreciate your time. It's so fascinating now. Of course, people at home can get more information, right? Right. His book, The Plant Paradox, really takes us to a whole other level with our relationship with plants and the work that he's done. Amazing. So our next guest is Dr. Chestnut. Now tell us about him. Dr. Chestnut, teaches us about the importance of nutrition, but in a very different way. He basically tells us to throw away all of what we're thinking and to focus on the human diet. Wow, I like people like that. Take a look at this. Dr. Chestnut, thanks so much for being here today. It's my pleasure. You've spent your career, you've spent the past 20 years looking at why people are sick, what it takes to, to get them better, and then also how the system has failed them. Yeah, I mean, early on, I, I always say that I'm, I'm the son of a PhD biologist, and then mm. I became a physiologist before I became a chiropractor. But the question I had was, why are human beings so sick compared to every other species? Humans are, we have the sickest youth, the sickest babies, the sickest uh, teenagers, uh, the sickest middle-aged, and the sickest elderly. And what I realized early on was that um, we sort of come to this idea that somehow there's something defective about humans, that they're genetically defective, and that's why we have this pandemic of chronic illness. But when I really started to look into it, that was different than the explanation for any other species on Earth. We've never blamed genes for species getting sick, ever. In the history of biology, has a species ever become endangered or gone extinct because of bad genes? And then what I realized was that the human genome, for all intents and purposes, has not changed in 20,000 years. We have mm -hmm. the same genes and we all share the human genome. We're all part of the same species. And so chronic illness rates have done this since the end of World War II. Heart disease, diabetes, obesity, depression, anxiety, addiction, you name it, has skyrocketed in just the last 60, 70 years. 
no change in our genes, a skyrocketing change in chronic illness. So how can we blame this on this? It makes wow. no logical or statistical mm. mathematical sense. And yet if we look at the change of our lifestyle, how we eat, move and think, our habitats and our lifestyles within those habitats, it's almost a perfect correlation. And I believe it's cause and effect. In fact, I can prove it is. And when you say the research, the, the time that you've spent really proving this, right. tell us a little bit about how you come to your conclusions. Well, uh, being trained in science and research methodology, what I do is I, as I look at the literature. So I'm not a primary researcher. I, I read other mm -hmm. people's research. Mm -hmm. So for instance, early on, it would be things, uh, people like Boyd Eaton, who was uh, from Emory University, who was really one of the leaders in looking at humans as a, as a mammalian species and understanding that, that really if we want to be healthy, we have to eat what our genome has been evolved to, to, to eat. In other words, giraffes are healthy as healthy today as they ever have been. And that's true of all mammalian species or all animal species except the ones we've destroyed their habitat. And in fact, if an animal does become endangered, we don't assume it's genes, we don't give it drugs, we don't do any of those things, we save its habitat. And we know that if we can save the habitat, of a species, that the species will naturally genetically express its potential for health. Uh, all animals are genetically uh, designed for health. All humans that are alive today are genetic superstars. All of their ancestors had to survive since we walked out of Africa. You know, so in order for us to be here, in order for us to, to have all our generations, all our had to survive for millennia. Mm -hmm. So that means through natural selection, obviously, we're strong genetically. We can't, it's absurd to blame genes and think that somehow we now have a weak gene that's causing breast cancer or a weak gene that's causing obesity or a weak gene that's causing Alzheimer's or whatever else. And so somebody said, well, it's because we're living longer, living longer. But the truth is, is that the, 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 the largest increases in chronic illness aren't amongst our elderly, they're amongst our children in middle age. So how can we, how can we blame lifespan? It doesn't make any sense. It's fascinating what you're saying, and, and I think you're, you're explaining it in such a way that it's like logical and it makes sense what you're saying. Where did we go wrong? I think we went wrong early on when we moved away from eating, moving, and thinking in ways that are genetically congruent. We, and really that occurred when we started moving into large cities. And so the first thing that happened was communicable diseases because we started literally you know, our sewage went into the same water we drank mm. and we couldn't refrigerate food. So we, we then, when you got to feed that many people, you've got to store food for longer. And so then we started eating food that had spoiled. So we had foodborne illness and um, basically uh, poor sanitation were the leading causes of our problems. And we solved those problems long before we knew what a germ was, by the way, because we kind of figured out, if you even if you look at a city like Edinburgh, they started figuring out that they probably shouldn't dump the carcasses and dump sewage out the window, you know, mm -hmm. on the lower floor. And then when we did that, our, our, our mortality rates went down, especially our infant mortality rates mm -hmm. went down, so our lifespan started to crawl back up. But, the, but lifespan in any species is determined by the genome of that species. And so no matter what, humans are going to live to about 120 years. So if we don't live to 120 years, right, we shouldn't blame our genes. We either got an illness, we got trauma, we you know, broke a leg, got an infection in the early days, whatever it is. But you can't shift lifespan of a species based on genome because the genome's the same in the species. It stays the same. So what our lifespan is set by our genome, right? The potential for our lifespan. Right. And whether or not we express that potential and live to that 120 years is based on our habitat. So we went wrong as we started to build cities and communities and, and, and cohabitat in that, in that manner. And when you fast forward to where we are today, what are the biggest challenges that you see in the work that you do with, with so many sick people and, and how you sort of help them to get onto a better path, let's say? Well, the first thing I think is that we have to understand that the entire allopathic medical system is based on the premise that people are sick because they're defective. They're sick because they have a bad gene or an inability to regulate their own blood pressure or cholesterol or whatever. And so the whole system is based on this idea of what's called homeostasis, meaning, as an example, your body's supposed to be in this state of balance. So blood pressure, homeostatic blood pressure is around 120 over 80, just as a very easy example. And so they think, they, they've been taught, and the whole premise was that if you move out of that homeostatic range, that there's something wrong with you. And of course, what we now know from great researchers who look at allostasis or allostatic load, Bruce McEwen out of Rockefeller, Teresa Seaman out of UCLA, Peter Sterling out of University of Pennsylvania, these great physiologists have come up and said, well, look, it can't be 
that somehow our genes change and all of a sudden we have high blood pressure. And it can't be that we've lost the ability to self-regulate. That doesn't make any sense. What's happened is we're under stress. And so we're not eating properly. We're not getting the right nutrients. We're not exercising enough. We're under a great deal of emotional stress. And it shifts our, what, our autonomic nervous system, our, our fight or flight versus our rest and digest. And we move towards fight or flight. And that shifts our physiology. And so the problem is, is that the premise of allopathy is that the patient in front of you has a defect and therefore they cannot regulate themselves, so we must regulate them with a drug. Mm. And that model is proven to be incorrect, and yet it's still the basis of all the diagnosis and treatment. So I, a great example of sort of understand that is to say, well, when a bear hibernates, if you were to take its blood pressure, mm -hmm. right, it would be very different than when the bear's running around in summer. Right. At which point is the bear sick? When it's hibernating, does it need a drug to raise its blood pressure? or does it need a drug when it's running around in the summer to lower its blood pressure? And the answer, of course, is neither. That both of those blood pressures are appropriate for the habitat that it's living in or, or, or for, for its surroundings. And so the genes don't change. The bear has the same genes while it's hibernating as it does when it's running around. So it can't be genes. Our genes stay constant throughout our lifetime, but our metabolism goes up and down. Whether we're sick and well can go up and down, but our genes stay the same, so it must be something else. And now that's where epigenetics comes in. Mm -hmm. And now what we understand is it's which genes we're expressing at any given time that determines our blood pressure, cholesterol, whether we're sick or well. But what determines the expression of genes isn't genes. Mm -hmm. What determines the expression of genes is our habitat and our choices we make in that habitat. So some of the choices that we're making in our habitat when you look at the amount of diabetes and you look at, at the obesity right. that we see in our world today, or certainly in our country, and, and, and it's becoming more of a global... In the world, in the industrial world, for correct. sure. What are the things that have the largest impact? The things that have the biggest impact on that are lifestyle choices. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you even hear things like, well, you know, the native population in the First Nations population in Canada and the U.S. and around the world, they're sort of genetically predisposed to diabetes or, and or obesity. But then you say to yourself, well, how many people were obese in North America before Europeans showed up? Right. Zero. Yeah. Zero. How many had, were obese? How many had diabetes? You know, if you look at all the chronic illnesses, they didn't exi basically didn't exist. And then when they changed their lifestyle, they skyrocketed. But it's so common now, it's not actually illogical, but it's just erroneous. It's a fallacious uh, sort of uh, conclusion. But it would be, well, if there are so many of them have this problem, it must be an inborn error. It must be something wrong with them. And I use the analogy often to say, well, if you put a bunch of wild animals into a zoo, and the only animals you studied were the ones in the zoo, and clearly those are less healthy and sicker than the ones that are in the wild, eventually you assume there's something wrong with the animals because they're all sick. But that's us. Humans now, are, we're wild animals living in captivity. The, the city, as Desmond Moore says, is not the concrete jungle, it's the human zoo. So we're under wow. incredible emotional strain, we're under strain from lack of proper nutrition, and we're under strain from a lack of exercise. And those things together, pool together, bioaccumulate over time and create chronic illness. What are the two or three things, based on the literature, that we can do to improve our nutrition? Well, certainly it would be to eat fresh, fruits and vegetables and uh, eat only, if you're going to eat meat, eat meat that is grass finished, not just grass fed. Uh, all cows are grass fed, mm. but it, don't eat cows that are full of grain, fed grains and soy and all these things because it changes their uh, omega-3 fatty acid content to almost zero and fills them full of omega-6 fatty acids, which are known cancer causing agents. They're pro-inflammatory and the basis of all chronic illness, if you look at it, you know, the inflammation, the the the, the down-regulated immunity, the insulin resistance, the decreased sex hormone binding globulin, all of these things that y you would look at, a lot of that is based on our diet. Mm -hmm. Omega-6 fatty acids are devastating and a lack of omega-3 fatty acids are, is also really important. So I would say fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, water, stay away from all refined carb carbohydrates. There's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. And so we got, we got taught early on because people were trying to sell more grain and dairy that we should eat more grain and dairy, but there's not a human on earth that ate any grain or dairy until we started farming. And after we farmed, we know we're less healthy now than we were. No mammal on earth drinks milk past infancy, not one. And they certainly don't drink milk from another mammal. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's very simple, eat the human diet. There's no special diet, there's no magic, there's no shortcuts. Eat what all your human ancestors evolved on, which is wild game meat or the equivalent, right. nuts, seeds, fruits and vegetables and lots of water. Dr. Chestnut, you speak about eating right for our species type. Yes. That's a simple logical thought and... Um, <laughs> that has worked brilliantly for every species on Earth. <laughs> makes a ton of sense. Right. 
And Give us an example. Well, I just think that um, there are so many new fad diets out, and that doesn't yeah. occur in any other species. Like giraffes right. don't wonder what they should eat next year. <laughs> yeah. Know, giraffes eat what all the other, you know, giraffes eat the giraffe diet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, salmon eat the salmon diet. Snakes eat the whatever species of snake they are, they'll eat that diet. And so, and of course they teach their offspring to eat that diet, and they've been eating that same diet since they became a species, and it right. doesn't change. And so, um, and the way to make them sick is to stop them from being able to, to get those nutrients from their habitat. And once you look at humans as an animal species and understand that we have the same, we, we, are, we must obey the same physio physiological laws, we're governed by the same laws as every other species on mm -hmm. Earth, it just becomes easy and it makes sense. You don't look for fads, you look for, okay, well, what are humans supposed to eat? Isn't, I mean, I always thought, isn't that the best question? Right. And how much exercise are humans supposed to have? Um, and, you know, how are humans supposed to socialize with each other? How are we supposed to make each other feel safe, loved, important, and appreciated in a group and to, to love ourselves and have self-esteem and all those things. So once you understand that that's part of our genetic makeup, that we require those things, uh, they're essential for us, um, it makes sense to me that to pursue it. And because we all share the same genome, we don't have to make it individual for each person. Mm -hmm. We all need vitamin C. You might want to get it from an orange. I might want to get it from cabbage. But we don't differ on the fact that we need vitamin C. But we, so in other words, as we moved out of Africa around the world, we knew that we, you know, through trial and error, if we didn't get the right nutrients, mm -hmm. we died. Right. So when you move to the Arctic, that's a very different climate and environment than it is in Africa. It didn't mean you didn't need vitamin C. It just meant you weren't going to get it from citrus fruit. You had to find another source of it or you were going to perish. And so I always love to use the Inuit because the Inuit are the probably the, the people on earth who have consumed the most fat in the history yes. of the human species. I was just in Alaska uh, recently and, and had the opportunity to speak to a number of the Inuits. Right. So tell us. Well, I always just use them as an example because, you know, the Inuit would have, you know, I always joke and they say they have a blubber breakfast, yes. uh, followed by a blubber snack, yep. followed by a blubber lunch, and then they'd mm -hmm. have a blubber uh, afternoon snack, and then a blubber dinner, and a blubber midnight snack, and Correct. it was, you know, depending on which time of year, it was still light out, you know. And so they had no heart disease, no diabetes, yeah. nothing. And they studied these, and they also found out that it's where, it's where we originally found out about omega-3 fatty acids were the Inuit, mm -hmm. uh, because they weren't getting any of these problems, and, and they ate tons, copious amounts of meat, and they ate copious amounts of fat. And, and yet they were incredibly healthy. And so that's where we figured out how important omega-3s are versus omega-6 fatty acids. But also what's really interesting is um, the Inuit that would be not far away from the Inuit that were still living there and eating their traditional diet, the ones just literally within 50 or 60 miles that started eating the white flour and the white sugar, you know, and white dairy, what I call the whitey plague, um, mm. they got sick. They got yeah. obese, and, and we could look at we could actually look at the differences between them. And the other great interesting group is the Aboriginals in Australia, who basically lived on kangaroo, or the or the natives in America who lived on bison, and they ate huge amounts of meat. Or the natives in the west coast of North America, where they ate huge amounts of salmon, and and these people were the, amongst the had the healthiest bones, the healthiest teeth. They had no acne anywhere, no obesity or diabetes. And so you think to yourself, when did fat become the enemy? And the answer, of course, is. Ansel Keys, when he came up with that study, which he found out later he was lying about. Absolutely. I remember when I was in Dutch Harbor in Alaska and I was spending some time on this concept of blubber and asking, you know, why do you eat so much blubber, uh, seal blubber, whatever it may be? And, and the answer I got, which really fascinated me, was for energy. The blubber, instead of drinking coffee, when it's cold and they need to be nourished. It's the right. blubber that, that feeds them. And then, of course, they eat different berries and things like that. But it's this that they look to to, to gain their health and their well-being and nourishing their bodies. Of course. And for most of the year, of course, they don't have any access to berries. Right. So the, what's interesting about the blubber is, is fat is where we store, store all our fat-soluble vitamins. And so... Vitamin A, vitamin D. All of those fat-soluble mm -hmm. vitamin E. And then, of course... Um, they had they also ate a lot of organ meats where they could get you know the vitamin D from the livers and all these other yeah. things. So they had to figure out how to live, how to get the same essential nutrients as their ancestors in Africa, in that habitat. Right. And that's how to be healthy. You have to find out how to get the same nutrients, correct? The same essential nutrients wherever you live around the world, wherever community you live in, whatever habitat you live in, in order to be healthy. What your job is is to find out what's how to get the things that you require in that habitat. Now, the reason we're so sick, one of the reasons, is because we've been basically told that to be healthy, you need a doctor. You don't need to learn from your parents how to find the things mm. that your ancestors found. And that's a big difference, a huge difference. Dr. Chestnut, 
how do you think we got down this rabbit hole of fat is bad and it's all relating to cholesterol and, and the impact it has on our heart? How did we go there? Well, it's great that you use the term rabbit hole because I've got a really neat explanation for that. And if you look back even before Ansel Keys, a guy, a Russian researcher by the name of Anishkov, thought he found cholesterol in plaques and arteries. And, and sort of like the concept of the germ theory, if you take it out and put it in another animal, it causes sickness. So he took out the cholesterol and he actually injected it into rabbits. And what he found out was is that it caused atherosclerotic plaques. And he said, aha, I've, got, I've, I've found the cause of, the, of, of basically atherosclerosis and, and plaques and arteries. It's cholesterol. And so then, you know, of course, this got taken down by Ansel Keys and later. But of course, later on, what someone realized was that rabbits are vegan. And vegans never get that genetically. They have no idea how to process cholesterol. The only source of cholesterol is animal meat. And so when he injected it into dogs, which are omnivores or mostly carnivores, no plaques. So the whole start of it was based on, on, on mythology, really, or a mistake, uh, because he injected it into a vegan. And so then that got carried on, and then it became an industry, the low-fat industry, the margin industry. And I mean, you know, the Ansel Key story, I'm sure, so, and how he fibbed about his research. And um, so all the countries with the high fat intake with low heart disease were left out. And from there, an industry spawned. And once an industry spawns and money gets involved, uh, billions and billions and billions of dollars, it's very hard to turn that ship around. Dr. Chestnut, thank you so much for sharing your insights on habitat and how it impacts nutrition and, and really how we can be healthy and just look back to our ancestors and what our species should and has done. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, I mean, we, we accumulated the wisdom of how to be healthy over millions of years as hominids, and uh, it's been lost in one generation. Yeah, that's really kind of an interesting concept. What do you think? I think it's just great. When he gave the example of the giraffe, right? The giraffe mm -hmm. eats for its species. It's not gonna change what it eats. It will change its habitat if it starts to get sick. And his point about us eating for our species, rather than doing what we've been doing, is very important. It's a simple, concept and one that for me resonates very deeply yeah it, it makes a little sense i mean it makes sense not a little sense a lot of sense and why because if you think about it for the last 60 plus years maybe even the last 100 years we haven't been eating because of what we need we've been eating because of economics oh. remember you know there's somebody else told us about this food pyramid and all these things and what to eat in the morning what to eat in the afternoon what to eat in the evening it had nothing to do with what you need it had to do with selling products that were sitting on shelves let's be honest so this theory about us remembering what it would be like to eat honestly how about like those little animals on a savanna right which we came from okay if you don't believe in evolution how about thousand two thousand year ago man there were no microwaves yep right i got it it's good Again, another amazing episode with some amazing people. Thank you so much for bringing these people together to share these stories with us, Naomi. Well, Montel, the work that they've done, their life's commitment to this area of research is humbling. It truly is humbling to me. Every single one of these people yeah. had information that is critical to all of us understanding so that we can start to get our lives on track, right? Absolutely. Well, it would be almost criminal if you only got this information for yourself. It's really simple. All you got to do is reach down, you know, push the little button below us right here on the screen that says share with a friend and let them have the same opportunity to change their lives the same way you will. And, you know, don't worry if you didn't see episodes one through three. You have an opportunity right now, if you click below, you can pick up the entire series when it's over and have it for your own home library. So, if I were you, that's exactly what I'd do. Henry, thank you again. This has been great. Oh, it's been such an opportunity. Thank you, Montel. So now tomorrow, guys, you know, we have episodes number five. So come on back and join us again for another episode of The Real Skinny on Fat. This has been called fasting in general and this fasting mimicking diet, you know, perhaps the best scientific breakthrough of 2017, certainly in my practice. It does introduce people to the idea that food is really medicine. It introduces people to the idea that plant-based food might be the best choice most of the time.
The reason it's important is because your body doesn't want to grow if there's no nutrients. So if there's no nutrients, your body will shut down all the growth pathways and therefore kind of starve the cancer of what it needs to grow. What we discovered again is the four or five days of fasting stress the body enough to push the stem cells to replace the elderly cells. So you're, yes. you're replacing old with new and that's the definition of reversing a state of aging. At the end of six months, there's been considerable weight that's been lost sort of in the midsection. Absolutely. And but not a loss of lean muscle mass? If anything, based on our clinical trial, there was actually slight gain of lean muscle mass. Autophagy is very critical. What's critical about the aging model is that organelles are aging. They're right. old. So they tend to accumulate damaged or old or aged organelles unless the autophagy is there to basically recycle them.